Hello and welcome to The Last Standy, a board game podcast coming to you from three exciting countries across Europe. This is a, a very special episode, it's going to be a two-parter, and for this first part, I'm joined here by Alexis. From Belgium, hello. And Alessio. Hello. So, the subject of this recording uh, is to do with, I think it's fair to say, one of the biggest pieces of news in board gaming of this year, which <laughs> is that uh, Kingdom Death Monsters second Kickstarter campaign has delivered its first substantial piece of content since they did the 1.5 update um, a few years ago, while I was still living in the UK. So it's been a long wait, uh, and the reason we never talked about Kingdom Death beforehand is because I wanted to talk about other board games, so I was like, can we wait until the Gambler's Chest is arriving, and then we can do a talk about it. Uh, so it's on me, and uh, that's it. It's, oh. my, it's, it's my fault. I think it's fair to say that uh, no one could have expected that it would take a grand six years for yeah. the GC to arrive. Yeah, it's. I wish, I wish that what the content was in the GCE had been part of a second Kickstarter, but at this point it's water under the bridge. Um, and early reports are the GCE is um, looking pretty good. So I will reserve final judgment till it arrives. But the stuff I've seen, I think I'm going to be very happy with it. But before we get into all of that, and before I uh, do a little wax lyrical about the history of it, let's uh, let's do a standee catch up. And how are things with you, Alessio? Well, uh, I'm doing pretty well. I had a bit of vacations already, so I managed to get rested and ready to start some KDM. Uh, the most interesting part of, uh, at least on the gaming side, of course, uh, the most interesting part is that I got a Kickstarter copy of uh, Keep the Heroes Out. So uh, I got from a retailer a uh, Kickstarter copy of Keep the Heroes Out, which is a pretty fun co-op dungeon defense board game, which I wanted to play because it's uh, very essential, beautiful, Nicely, nicely. Uh, it's like a cartoonish version of Root <laughs> uh, in art style. I, I like it a lot, and I'm eager to play it actually because uh, the family is scattered almost everywhere in this uh, at this time. The kids are at scout camps uh, and so on. So uh, a bit of trouble setting up uh, at night, but. This is it, basically. And what about you, Alexis? Uh, on my end, not too many um, board game news. Uh, recently, the only real board game that I've been playing is uh, Waypoint by um, Postmark Game, I think uh, is the name. Yeah, uh, yeah Postmark Games. Postmark. Uh, really, really good addition to their little uh, solo print-your-own board game. Uh, it's plays very well it's very fun uh, it can easily be played with uh m more people um enjoy that a lot and yeah. uh yeah not, not that many uh big news because i'm currently planning uh, to move uh probably around september or october so i'm very uh very excited about that um and uh, i've not been been super able to to play too much recently so that's big news yeah exactly <laughs> uh, and on your end, Fen. Uh, well, um, I got a chance yesterday to play Dawn of the Zeds 3rd Edition, and I hate tower defense games. I, I absolutely zombie. hate them. Uh, no, I don't mind zombie games. I think zombie, ge <laughs> zombie games are interesting because of the human stories that they can tell. Um, Dawn of the Zeds managed to make me not realize it was a tower defense game until <laughs> we finished the game and one of the guys I was playing with said, uh, it's really good for a tower defense game. And I was like, you're right. I didn't even clock that it was tower defense because there's so much more... Uh, going on so i'm probably going to talk about that on the podcast uh, in the future when the physical copy arrives uh, my mother bought it for me for my upcoming birthday so um that's when well, i'll get that whenever when it turns up uh so that's the main thing otherwise uh, i have finally decided to paint one of the four or five white lions i have laying around the place um <laughs> 
I got one painted, but I was like, you know what, I'm going to paint another one because I've I've wanted to paint one in a, a bit more of a desaturated kind of palette, a more um, sepia one. Uh, and um, yeah, that's literally here with the front of its face ripped off because I don't glue the face on until after I've painted because otherwise you can't access the inside of the mouth very <laughs> easily. Uh, and beyond that, I have just been lurking around and soaking up stuff for the gambler's chest. Uh, and also been, and here is my little plug, I have been using KDM Simulator a lot. I'm going to talk about that in this episode here. Uh, and been setting up a YouTube channel for uh, KDM Simulator content initially. Maybe other boss battlers later, but I've already got like... I don't know, 50 episodes worked out. I just need to record them and schedule them up. So um, I'll be busy with that for the, for the near future. Apart from that, this week's been a nightmare because I plan to do recording for said YouTube channel Monday and Tuesday. Um, I have to record when my partner isn't working because they, uh, they work for the, the uh, municipality here. And so there's confidential details at times. And even though it's in Swedish... This microphone picks like a lot up, so I couldn't <laughs> couldn't do it. So we had wood arrive Monday and then wood arrive Tuesday. And then I was like, okay, I can try and record some stuff today. And I got halfway through the episode and then flubbed it big time. And I was like, I need to stop. I'll just stop and maybe try and edit the two halves together or just redo the whole thing. I prefer to do a one take if I can. Um, it helps with my flow. And I think it sounds a bit more natural. But yeah, that's basically it, really. Uh, um, you know, uh, Dawn of the Zeds and uh, KDM stuff. Um, you know, all things going. Of course, uh, by the time this goes out, Gen Con will have been uh, been happening. And um, I'll have been sitting there looking at all of the different videos of new games and interviews and everything. So it's an exciting time. Especially, this is kind of the first Gen Con, really, where outside of sort of lockdown, where people are really turning up yeah it's yeah like... it's it's the biggest one since uh 2019 at the very least yeah i think panic crawlers stand there too uh, i was kind of reading they will be there i don't know if they will ever stand too so yeah there's also the horror on the orient express board game um that's gonna i think be demoed there from chaosium and horror on the orient express is one of my top three all-time <laughs> role-playing campaigns um, behind complete masks of Nahalatep and the enemy within for Warhammer, so I'm super excited about that. I would, I, I really love to. Have, I've always thought it'd be great to have a board game version. I, I kind of pictured maybe the Fantasy Flight would do it, but the, this Chaosium are doing it. Oh, and while I remember, before we move on, I'm super excited because Earthborn Rangers will be arriving soon, and that's from the guys who originally did Arkham, and I have heard it is like really good. Yeah. Really, really good. I, I, I saw a couple playthrough. It's interesting, pretty interesting, yeah. A good narrative. You are not fighting all the time. Actually, you shouldn't. Fun, fun. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, let us get on to our main topic, which is uh, going to be all about uh, Kingdom Death Monster. So... To give a little bit of a history, um, there's a thread you can follow back from where this game kind of gets its origins. And it's a, I would call it a child of two franchises, plus um, very much the child of the two lead designers, who uh, I think definitely are broadly responsible for a lot of the aesthetic. Of course, we'll talk about the homages and similar as well but uh, if you go all the way back to the uh, like 1980s you have a game um, called Chainmail which um, is like the precursor to Dungeons and Dragons and it provided sort of two things which is first of all modern role-playing games all draw their descent from Chainmail in one way or another because D&D comes from Chainmail and I think D&D is fair to say it's the first sort of gamified kind of role-playing thing that's not just improvised acting. Um, it's certainly the progenitor from modern role-playing, but it also gave birth to dungeon crawlers. And the very notable one came from MB Games, who did it in association with a company that Ian Livingston and Steve Jackson had set up called Games Workshop. And this game was, of course, called HeroQuest. 
Uh, I think have we all played Hero Quest? Yeah. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so the best thing about Hero Quest is we've all played Hero Quest. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, what happened from that is get it was a huge hit. It had like a sci-fi version, the 40k universe, of Space Crusade, and Games Workshop were like, "Hey, we want to capitalize on this." So they did Advance Hero Quest, which I have a really battered old copy in the attic that an ex housemate of mine, um, like who's a bit quite a bit older than me, uh, gifted to me before he moved to Canada, um, and it's not very good. Like aesthetically, it's really cool and the concept's fantastic, but mechanically, uh, it uses D12s. I love D12s, and I feel awful saying that any game that uses D12s isn't very good, but it isn't very good. Coming on from that, though, was Games Workshop's second attempt, which was Warhammer Quest. And this was a, it was a bit of a breath of fresh air because it was the first time they took the dungeon crawling format and removed the need for a GM. You could play with a GM, but you didn't necessarily need them. And we know with 100% certainty that Adam Poots, the lead designer and creator of Kingdom Death Monster, uh, definitely played Warhammer Quest because he overtly references it in some of the most important uh, lore and power-related events in the hunt. Um, the, yeah, yeah, the, dwar the Dwarf Prospector and Portcullis, and we have the Portcullis and Prospector, which interestingly gives us access to a weapon that is a direct homage to one of the big thematic influences on the game, which is um, Berserk, which we'll talk about in detail. Um, so what kind of happens is a Games Workshop have this moment where they just go, specialist game sucks, and they can't try and tank everything, and Warhammer Quest falls off the face of the earth, and... Um, there's not really any dungeon calling for quite a while until Kevin Wilson, who designed Arkham Horror, at least second edition, I think he did the first edition, uh, gave us Descent. And Descent brought back that Hero Quest one versus many. And I think it's more of a direct descendant from Hero Quest than it is from Warhammer Quest. Um, so that kind of ran off. And then we get like Gloomhaven and Madara. They all sort of descend from that same like Descent family. Um, but on the other side... For Warhammer Quest, there's nothing until Warhammer Quest comes back. Except sitting in the brainchild of, of Adam Poots. And um, he, in 2012, launches a Kickstarter for a game that is... Well, at the time, it's, it's a bit kind of not super clear what's going on exactly. It's, kind of, it's a line for um, the monsters that he wants to do for this dungeon crawler called Kingdom Death Labyrinth. Um, and it kind of, it, it follows on from its name by becoming a complete monster and sort of taking over. Anyway, um, so that's like one lineage that gets the Kingdom Death Monster. That's the board game lineage. Um, but we also have a tabletop lineage, which is boss battlers themselves. Uh, they start with the World of Warcraft card game, and there's a raid mode that happens. And World of Warcraft card game kind of um, falls apart. And then we don't see much in boss battles until Sentinels of the Multiverse turns up. And I think that's the first modern non-collectible card game or even board game that gives us a, a boss battler. And um, I have a copy and it's all right. It's obviously it feels a bit dated and it's um, awkward that if you play with less than three players, you have to control three heroes at a minimum. But it is very thematic and very fun. And superheroes versus supervillains is, is that's a boss battling genre as a whole. Uh, so yeah, that's I think I think I'm right there really saying like superheroes kind of boss battlers normally. Yeah, in thematically, I would, I would say yeah. so. Yeah, uh, normally, yeah. Um, so just to finish up and get to the point, the final thread that links into this and is a huge influence is Monster Hunter, which is a premier video game boss battling game, and we will see its influences heavily in Kingdom Death in that you craft weapons from the remains of bosses you've defeated and uh, also uh, the interesting use of a waist slot instead of legs and feet which is more traditional you have you know hands body head legs and feet instead it's waist and feet and also the fact that you can cut certain parts of the monster that can give you like different resources in in rewards of it uh, that's also yeah. directly inspired by monster hunter yeah absolutely and then we oh, have uh, the Go on. I, I would also point out the the weapon specialization is also kind of inspired by Monster Hunter in uh, in some ways too. 
Yeah, it, it's certainly, um, it's rarer you'll find stuff before Kingdom Earth Monster um, in the board game world, which has like this levelling up of focus of one particular weapon type. You'll find classes who maybe lean into weapons in some ways, like, you know, the idea of barbarians with axes and stuff. But I think, yeah, yeah, you're definitely right. Um, so our last thread, and I hope somebody else can pick up on this one, um, is the anime manga Berserk. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Berserk is, is definitely a massive inspiration. I don't think, uh, not from a story or direct, let's say, lore thread, but very much into a visual one. Uh, there's a lot of artwork into Kingdom Death that is... Uh, Inspired? No, no, no. It's inspired by. It's inspired by. But I'd say also the themes of Berserk are inspired into Kingdom Death Monster as well, which is yeah. You know this kind of like dark world and the moments of hope come from the like individual stories of the characters struggling. Um, one of the themes I think is like very central to Kingdom Death is the strength of ad of like people in the face of adversity. Um, uh, it's obviously yeah. not one of the most dominant themes, uh, as we'll get on to. But yeah, definitely, I think mechanically the game's very, you know, uh, yeah. So anyway, carry on uh, with us a little bit more about Berserk, because um, Berserk is a super influential property. It's like, alongside Jojo's Bizarre Adventure and Junji Ito, one of the most influential like mangas, I think. One Piece, obviously, I you know, and so on. But uh, yeah. Yeah, but, but Berserk is one of the OG one. Um it's it's also um berserk has also influenced so many other games that uh, themselves fed back into kingdom death with uh, for example dark souls as a uh, massive berserk inspiration in in its universe that kind of um, encroaching darkness onto onto humanity that also feeds uh into into kingdom death uh, so it draws inspiration from berserk and also other media inspired by Berserk because Berserk is one of the very original one with this very different take on dark fantasy because Berserk is extremely inspired by um, Conan the Barbarian or uh, Elric of uh, Many Bone, uh, like the the very OG fantasy uh, dark fantasy. It's got a it ties a lot back into Lovecraft yeah. as well because Love Lovecraft influenced uh, quite a number of prolific Japanese manga artists and um, there is definitely cosmic horror in Berserk and I'd say in Kingdom Death as well. Yeah, and th there's something that is uh, always interesting in the ways that every media kind of re-influences itself through, di through, different, uh, through different vectors and the... Uh, Nothing is truly uh, original because it's because every every artist, every uh, author has a, an inspiration. And Kingdom Death comes from so many different sources. But at the time, uh, in, in 2012, it was very much uh, out of the left field, sort of, because, and I think that's, that's important to... to it, what makes it special is that uh, Adam Poots does not have a classical board game experience it was his first board game and it was very much a kind of a, a project that was its own thing uh, and i think that's that's a lot of what gives it its its characters that kingdom death just yeah didn't try to, to try to be something very different from, yeah, from other stuff you're probably into the name there because the the, the fact uh, uh, that uh, actually completely blew me away when I first played Kingdom Death was the was the the situations, the narrative you that could emerge by simply playing the AI cards of the monster and the the simple idea of having an AI deck and an HL deck was at the time I think revolutionary. Well uh, you, you, yeah you're rushing forward a bit there. We are we are getting a little ahead of ourselves, but yeah, yeah, um, yeah, certainly. Uh, I, I just was gonna what was I gonna say yeah. Um, it's when you look back, we we know that Adam worked for Atari and did yeah. web software development beforehand. We also know um, he's a like very much a child of the eighties and nineties and a big fan of Nintendo hard, as they call it. You know the old classic Nintendo games that are just really 
tough. Yeah. Um, well, we see like Chrono Trigger and Zelda uh, directly referenced I, on, alongside. Or, or also, he, from Mario Maker. <laughs> yeah. he, he really wants to make a 2D Kingdom Dev game that is a direct uh, homage to um, Ghouls and Ghosts. Yeah. It's a good choice. I love. Oh, Ghosts and Ghosts. I think it is. A, it is a great game. choice. It wouldn't be. It wouldn't be most people's first game to to jump into, and I think that kind of points to to the sort of game that Adams like. Um, this really difficult and uh, almost unfair kind of game. Uh, I, I think. I think there's a lot of um, uh, threads to yeah. be, between Ghouls and Ghosts. Yeah. And, uh, some fun of fact, the facts here. Uh, Kingdom Death Monster, the 2012 uh, project, was actually Adam's third attempt to bring, uh, actually the second attempt to make a game, because he he first yeah. tried, I think that the order was that he first tried to to pitch uh, an iPhone game, which was uh, like uh, Twilight uh, Order, Ember, a Twilight Knight, possibly, and the white speaker teaming up, which is uh, weird. Uh, I, it's not yeah. that weird because it's the theme he also wanted to use for Kingdom Death Labyrinth. Yeah, Look, it's like a white speaker yeah. and a savior and a Twilight Knight against the um, it's the Holy Lands, the characters they'd be going against, which don't really feature too much. In yeah, Kingdom and Death. That, yeah. that did not fund anyway, and after that he, he just sold, I think, the Forsaker miniature or a set of miniature for Genetic Fantasy, and from that, which funded but on a very limited budget, he managed to uh, to basically collect enough uh, among lore and resources and molds for stuff to make Kingdom Death Monster. Yeah, yeah, and that's the first Kickstarter, which was for the first game and the what we'd be calling the first wave of expansions when we look at them. Uh, that started on the 22nd of November 2012, <laughs> and... Um, it was it was funded like in the first day, which is very common these days. But if we think about back then, no, it's not that common. Yeah. Um, I remember that there was a um, competition on Board Game Geek, you know, the classic like winner copy type thing, and people were very um, like nervous about the game. They they were concerned um, where the the whole thing was going to go with, you know, like they thought. And they were concerned there was going to be more uh, sexual violence. There isn't any sexual violence in the game, um, which, you know, that's, I appreciate that yeah. a great deal. Mm. Um, yeah, but there was like concerns about it because of this dark aesthetic and the fact that there's a Cronenbergian level of body horror. Um, and it's not afraid to use um, genitalia uh, in various bits and pieces. There was also some, some miniatures that he published before the game and that aren't related to the game that uh, lean a little bit more, a bit more into that. Uh, and I think it's a good thing that for the game, uh, Adam Adam didn't really went too much into that direction. <laughs> yeah, but well, that's the thing. Like with Berserk as well, the early Berserk has like sexual violence, and you'll see that um, eventually uh, Kentaro gets out of that and um, develops. And he, I think, he expressed a bit of like he wish he hadn't have done so much early on, but he was it was a product of. The time that he was doing and, things in, and the media and the stuff, inspired, that inspired yeah. it, like Conan and yeah. the like, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. So his later stuff, um, it's it's very character driven. It's still dark, but it is is less that. So the campaign ends at one point nine million, uh, making it a really um, successful campaign. One point nine million in twenty twelve is is staggering. Yeah, um, it was uh, if not the. the it was the biggest board game uh, Kickstarter at the time, and I think I think it was in the the, the top twenty of the, yeah, the biggest I, Kickstarter. I, I don't remember if it was the first one to break one million barrier, but uh, I think, uh, or at least from observation, I can say that uh, I started to see the big come on campaigns right after Kingdom Death. Uh, they had a lot of the model of giving you tons of stuff, tons of plastics and tons of stretch goals and stuff like that and add-ons and, 
everything else. I, I, I have always been of the idea that come on, copy the, the first Kingdom Death campaign. <laughs> It could well be. I mean, uh, given how successful, nearly 2 million in 2012, when Kickstarter was still a fairly young platform, that's going to make anyone sit up and go, oh, and yeah, I think you're right. It, it almost certainly helped form the model. Um, we we got a little bit more to get through. So just to wrap it up, the we get um, the there are three waves of shipping for the first Kickstarter. Uh it like finally delivers February 2016. It's listed as a 20, like for the whole thing, 2015. I think the core game arrived yeah. with people. And then around um, in uh, November 2016, uh, that basically Adam said, hi, we can't do the Lantern Festival for the price we've offered. Um, and so they refunded it. It just wasn't good enough. It, he, could, he couldn't do it justice, which I think is very fair, a very sensible <laughs> decision to make to be like, no, um, and, and refund it. And then literally um, the next month, we get, I don't know, like, not even the next month, literally, like, uh, um, two weeks later, the same month, near the end of the same year, on the 24th of November 2016, the new Kickstarter for what we call Kingdom Death 1.5 launches. And in two hours, it beats the original. It gets past two million. Uh, it is, it has like a whole bunch of exciting, like, tie ins, twist gaming, do some like showcase stuff of they fight a um, flower knight and some other bits and pieces. They, they have Zachary Barash on to control a, a survivor. And that finishes... Ooh, um, it, I can't remember. Where exactly does it uh, finish? I do uh, December, have, uh, December. Oh, yeah, no, it's... I got it. It's January 7th. All right. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it, there's a lot of stuff happens on January 7th because there's a big hype. And, it, yeah, it finishes at tw over... Oh, oh, it reaches 12 million. Yeah. So it goes past 12 million. It ends... Yeah, January 7th, 2017 is where it finishes. And um, it was the biggest ball game Kickstarter until Frosthaven turned up. Yeah. yeah. And and even yeah. even Frosthaven, like, uh, beat him, but not by too much. It's still uh, a yeah. mastodont. Um, yeah. No, seven years ago. And also about Frosthaven, uh, uh, Isaac, uh, <laughs> another fun fact, Isaac uh, Childress basically used the cheap trick to, to, to get past the kingdom that barrier because in the last 24 hours he uh, uh, collected up uh, very quickly the miniature and card versions of the content of envelope x the, the resolution of envelope x for the first gloom heaven which is a thing that fans were asking uh, around the world so basically everyone uh, Every everyone who pledged the, the original Gloom Heaven and the, the, the those fifteen dollars and that amounted for the the final amount, which, which was bigger than Kingdom Death. Yeah, it's also worth mentioning that Frosthaven by player volume is significantly higher. It is um, it, because Kingdom Death tends to be a lower number of backers who are pledging more each, and Frosthaven was a like a far lower amount to pledge. So uh, it's the same with o Oathsworn. Oathsworn's like a really numerically successful board game, um, but no everyone's points. paying less. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So eventually um, 1.5 arrives. It's an update to 1.31. And then a bit further down the line, we get a 1.6 legendary card pack update. <laughs> and then we get to where we're talking now when the gambler's chest is arriving in the in america and is due to arrive in europe sometime august or probably for me october because because sweden's very far on the back of the list for the distribution distributors um but we'll we'll see maybe maybe i'll be surprised and it'll turn up in august that would be lovely um so now we're just kind of going to discuss things and um i'm going to yield the floor having eaten up time with a rough probably not 100 percent accurate history in it but what we've managed to piece together from the information we found online and interviews and stuff so uh let's talk about the brainchild of adam and anna poots uh kingdom death monster and um we can start with the setting which is uh that old classic tropes and characters wake up with no memory of who they are uh, they're in a really dark place the floor has a bunch of uh, stone carved stone faces which is a homage to the eclipse event in Berserk. Um, and they look at each other. They don't know who each other is. They can't talk. 
Um, all they have is like lanterns and then this gigantic beast turns up and starts like eating a whole bunch of them until one chap is like instead of despairing and giving up he claws around for a weapon picks up a broken piece of stone face and he and three others go at this lion um, and that's where it all starts yeah, yeah. Uh, those, those survivors have ink on their eyes and uh, uh, well the the, the beautiful part about the theme which is a kind of a recurring theme uh, among the base game is that uh, the survivors are actually born as the lowest uh, the, the lowest part of the, the food chain basically uh, that was a thing that uh, Adam uh, uh, who uh, uh, lurked a lot and uh, actually uh, uh, acted a lot, interacted a lot with the community on BGG at the time, he kept repeat, repeating that we, we shouldn't feel pity for the survivors. They are, I think he compared them to ants, meaning that he doesn't expect them to have souls or something or, or anything like that. They are just animals uh, with human resemblances uh, who are predated, but basically everything there. Yeah, um, it's it's interesting because uh, obviously they they're, they're not human because we see some very unusual things happen to their physiology. <laughs> um, they're very mutable. But I would say one of the things that definitely isn't the case is they are not bottom of the food chain. Um, they would be, except that they've got the same thing we have, which is they have the capability to learn, pass on knowledge to each other and use tools so they, the, the, right when they wake up, they're definitely bottom of the food chain. But the moment they hit a settlement, they're not there anymore. They are definitely like, um, you know, primitive, pre-Bronze Age humans who were absolutely predators. And it even ties into with humans in a really interesting thematic way that they go on really long hunts to find stuff. And that's what we used to do. And we were terrifying to animals because... We do something none of them do. We can marathon run. So a deer would sprint away in terror and against the cat or a wolf or something like that, they would get exhausted and worn out and give up. But a deer would run away and then we'd still be coming after them and we'd be coming after them again and again. We have that marathon capability that is very, very rare, along with thumbs and brains that require a ton of energy and are really big compared to most of the other uh, living things on this planet. In fact... We've only just now reached the point where there's something on this planet that can mimic what our brains do, and we're in interesting times for that. Um, I can't wait for the first AI-created board game if it hasn't already happened, um, but that's a topic for another time. So uh, I just wanted to interject and say maybe the concept is their bottom of the food chain. I think more of it is that the everything views them as being at the bottom of the food chain, but they are like, Oh no, 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 you think that, but we're going to absolutely murder the heck out of you because we are nasty savages. And they do murder a lot of things. Yeah, uh, and especially later in when we'll talk about the, the gameplay, there's definitely a power creep that happens with some of the, some of the expansion, some of the way that uh, the game is played. And I think that this idea of being at the bottom of the food chain has kind of been relegated to the... Um, to the back of the mind in in some expansion. No, of course uh, it makes yeah. you think like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, what I really enjoy about the theme is that it keeps a lot of things um, obscured and into people's imagination. I don't. Adam said multiple times that he has a design bible with all of the rules about the universe and that it all makes sense and that there's a a sort of a quote unquote science be behind the the things that the survival see as magic. I am personally uh, of the mind that if the O4 did not directly put it into words into the 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 material uh it's free for people to to have their own go at their interpretation of it so kingdom because of that kingdom death has this very large realm where people can make up their own stories as they play the game and can interpret things their own ways and kingdom death is 
kind of build with this idea that you can put intent behind things and try to decipher meaning into into the world. Uh, in that way, it is very much Dark Soulsy, but it doesn't draw the it doesn't do it at the the same way that Dark Souls does it, and it's get, no. It, Dark Souls does it through its um, description. Uh, item description. Item description. Yeah. Uh, no, it also it also does it a lot through um, uh, environmental uh, storytelling and through. Like, yeah, uh, that's the advantage that FromSoft has well, have is they got fast environments. Yeah. Uh, for for Kingdom Death, though, it's very much done through, uh, for example, the AI deck, the way that um, the, the AI interacts with uh, with players. And little interactions, little text in the, the uh, hunts or the, the events. And it's all really interesting. I don't think that if the story of Kingdom Death was uh, laid out in a book or, or told uh, into a very long and dry uh, passage into into the the rule book uh, explaining how the world works. I don't think that it would be that interesting. I think that what makes it special is really this this obscuring veil that allows each player to have the sort of uh, I uh, think... imagination behind what's happening. Yeah. Uh, yes, I uh, yeah, I think I have an apt comparison here. Uh, for instance, uh, and this is. Uh, Possibly spoilery if someone uh, has not followed the, the second campaign and uh, has not read uh, any Kickstarter updates, so I keep this to a minimum. But at some point, when we broke the uh, when the campaign broke the exploding kittens record, uh, or went to 12 millions, possibly I don't remember exactly. Sure, check. Uh, Adam posted the. Uh, a bit of the lore behind the Abyssal Woods expansion with uh, some important lore about the, the Goblin. And uh, that part wasn't supposed to be uh, knowledge of the players because uh, it, it should have been emergent storytelling. And uh, uh, you basically should feel like when you understood what the Black Knight uh, really was by just the description basically that was the feeling behind that but uh, having that revealed it's still interesting but it's not that entertaining anymore because you already know and you know for sure that's that's how it goes so basically yeah you, you don't know for sure for sure because we have evidence that um, Adam's happy to steer yeah. the boat and change the direction oh, yeah. a little, depending what suits, which I think is fine because he's already set up a world filled with un unreliable narrators. Yeah, and anyway, I am okay with that. But it's like when the Space Marines in Warhammer 40k uh, be began to have a united, unified lore with the retcons with the Space Wolves and the Ultramarines and so on. Yeah. Let, let's let's be fair. Adam has not made the mess of history yeah. in the game yeah. from House of 40k. Yeah. Oh my goodness! And now they're re they're bringing in Primaris Marines in order to justify a new scale. It's it's amazing. I love Games Workshop, and Vulcan is one of my favorite characters ever. And I'd love to talk about that, but we don't have time. So let's get on with the uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, so, Okay, uh, you go, you go. <laughs> no, no, go, go for it, Alessio, go for it. No, I just wanted to say that actually Primaris Marines, which are bigger <laughs> Marines, are exactly the same as the survivor sitting bone marrow and getting bigger. So... <laughs> <laughs> I think they're more like the way um, that uh, the, uh, the original Kingdom Death is on one scale and everything has grown up by another like nearly five millimeters in size. <laughs> I love the new scale so much. It's great. The new scale is wonderful. Yeah, yeah it's, it's my second favorite scale in boss battling after Oathsworn. Yeah. Oathsworn. Oathsworn. It allows so Oathsworn, much more really. detail onto the miniature, but uh, we shouldn't go too deep into, into the, the miniatures. No, absolutely not. Yeah, uh, I just yeah. want to say one last thing about uh, the themes and the story is that it's, it's more leaning a little bit onto the gameplay, but Kingdom Death 
I don't think that it had a plan when it was originally thought of in terms of uh, how the game would evolve, how the new campaigns would um, latch onto the, the core one. And I think that's, that's also because of, of Adam's uh, not having experience making board games, right? It was his first board, uh, his first board game, and even if he has experienced um, game designer with him, I think that Adam is. Uh, it is known that he's, he's very much uh, the, the captain of the ship uh, in Kingdom Death. That also feeds into the the themes and the story not being extremely consistent because uh, there's a lot of retcons that need to happen if uh, Adam wants to justify having a new campaign or a new character or or making things work. For example, uh, the Dragon King uh, is technically the last of its kind uh, in the Dragon King campaign, but you can uh, hunt it to not extinction, apparently, uh, in, in other campaign, if you simply add the Dragon yeah. King to the game. And there's just a few elements but, but of the, the game the, that... The, there definitely are, but I think you're, the Dragon King's not one. The Dragon King is lampshaded in either through the end of the campaign, which I won't spoil, or the fact that the Dragon King is not the, the Dragon King. That Dragon King is just like a Giver summoned Evangelican Godzilla mech suit, basically. So even if you kill it and cut it to pieces... Um, the 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 guy in there can teleport. That is so, true. Yeah, I uh, but but I do I do agree. Like the the big retcon that we we should probably talk about is is one you go from one point three one to one point five. Yeah. Yeah. But um, shall we shall we discuss the 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 gear and the monsters? Yeah, bit? yeah. Let's talk um, a bit more gameplay because I think that's where yeah. the game really shines. Uh, yeah, we'll start with the monsters because it is Kingdom Death Monster, and the monsters are the stars. And then we'll look at all the. Survival can I bits. start with a, a little introduction to that though? Sure. I think that's the best aspect of uh, Kingdom Death. Uh, if you had to to boil it down and to uh, inspect every single uh, part of it separately, is the prologue. I think that is uh, the most well-crafted, most polished aspect of the game. Uh, the prologue against the White uh, Lion is where the game really just grabs you because I've never played uh, before that and since the only the only ones that I've played uh, are uh, not imitation but inspired, heavily inspired by Kingdom Death, I've never played a prologue as good as this one to explain uh, the game. It just works incredibly well, it's really well crafted, it has you um, build the monster deck in specific ways and experience the monster in a specific way for the first time and it directly gets players interested into the game because deep down kingdom death's rules are extremely simple the the core of how the game works is very simple very straightforward and can be explained very quickly and then everything on is just added on and built on top of that Absolutely. It starts very simply. Um, but I, I, I've I, spent some time like uh, dissecting the, the, the prologue white line. Um, and first of all, I'm going to say if you want to design a game or you want to um, inspect a game or take it apart, spreadsheets to your friend, you need to spreadsheet everything. Um, that's that's board game design for you, staring at spreadsheets for hours. But it's that that white line deck is so incredibly well done because first of all it leads off with a claw which it turns out claw is actually also the basic action for the white lion it also has like a mood to show you hey uh, monsters can do this thing where they get into a new like mode and state and it's really scary and dangerous and it also has um is it uh is it maul the one where it, it, it points out hey if you're knocked down on the ground then oh boy that's pretty bad for you good luck and before i hang on let me uh, and also the hit location deck has the strange hand setup which is super super cleverly done because it teaches you almost every single hit location mechanic in one single card uh, and that is really clever um i believe yeah yeah, I believe um, that Adam said Anna Poots did most <laughs> of the work on the first story. And um, I 
I think Anna Poots is a really, really competent designer, like really, really good. Probably my favourite designer out of everyone there. Um, Adam definitely designed my favourite expansion, um, but Anna, whenever I learned the bits that she did, consistently is like hitting always a high quality level. It doesn't, she doesn't have the same peaks and troughs that Adam's designs sometimes have. She's just almost always, boom, like the Gorm. She created the Gorm, and the Gorm is my second favourite monster, full stop. My favourite is the Sunstalker from Adam, but she also made my favourite campaign, which is People of the Stars, so it's just... Boom, boom, Every boom. monster but that I we feel... know that she walked on is just incredibly well designed. Yep. Um, so uh, I was just going to say, I think we should let Alessio talk a bit more because Alessio is the one oh, yeah. who is on a clock here. <laughs> so Alessio, you t you talk to us about what you want to talk about with Kingdom Death and then we can get back to talking about monsters or stuff yeah. at some other point. But I would just like to say I still love the White Lines design and Alessio, you have the first Yeah, one. actually, uh, of the about the White Lion, I have to say that it has the best crafted for the for its purpose, the best crafted the HL deck. I think the other uh, it location deck so thought out in the entire game is the Dumb Beetle Knight, but it has a completely different purpose because for the purpose of teaching, the entire HL deck of the White Lion is perfect. And the beautiful thing is that by having just one impervious location, by having no super dense locations by having a vast assortment of both persisting injuries and uh, all types of reactions he manages to teach you everything but when you uh, go to encounter level 1 and level 2 white lion which used to be the biggest divider between uh, noob and uh, kind of experienced player uh, it still works perfectly without changing a single card so uh, that's very thoughtful design and I appreciated it a lot and that's basically one of the two big things uh, I love about uh, the innovations brought by this game first I have to, like I anticipated earlier I I think that the best thing I like in Kingdom Death uh, is uh, actually the distinction between AI and HL deck because the AI is simply wonderful. It gives you a lot of theme, but it's not just that because the, the storytelling of everything actually goes from the AI to the location to the resources you get to what you craft with the resources to the uh, small or blurbs which happen, or the small hints during ant events which uh, uh, foreshadow things that would happen or would not, and so on. So everything is beautifully connected, and the AI deck is the first expressive deck of uh, PvE in board games. Basically, uh, by the time Kingdom that uh, was out, uh, there were a lot of, uh, there are a few examples, a few very consistent example of PvE uh, board games. There were a, a bunch of Dungeons and Dragons board games adventure, for instance, and stuff like that. But nothing was so organic and well designed and meant to be played like the AI. Just the, the, the idea of having flows where you could interject, then the control returns to the monster meant that you could be two or three minutes on a single AI, and that was, boom, beautiful. Yeah. Um, I would say, like, there's... When you look at a, uh, a computer boss, like, battle-type thing... Um, with say Monster Hunter, one of the interesting things is always how they try and scale for player numbers. And one of the big problems we've always had in board games is translating that because if you give a um, a boss multiple actions, um, it just kind of like overwhelms parties if you get it wrong. Um, but if they don't have enough actions, then you, you just like it doesn't really work quite correctly and kingdom death managed this neatness of hey the monster gets one action it's really accurate you have like it just deals damage it doesn't have to roll for to wound just that's it take your damage straight away but also where well, every time you hit it there's a chance it will get to react 
attacked or yeah. deliver some kind of damage back, which means uh, even on your turn, it gets to advance its own clock towards winning, which is really Yeah, really it makes Monster really scary in that way. Yeah, that, that's the way why I love the split design between AI and HL. Because, of course, if the monster just had one long AI, you could say, yeah, the monster wrecked my party, but now I have four turns, uh, he, he's destroyed. Or you could go with games like uh, Vagrant Song, uh, my survivor at the turn, so I have to have a turn with the monster, but in, in that, that way you would just have the monster wreck everything, uh, given the power level of the AIs uh, in this game. And the the HL having reactions and you having a say in trying to control those reactions is just the perfect blend of uh, tactics and uh, fun gameplay that was just missing before Kingdom Death Monster. So that, that's probably the single piece of brilliant design uh, I would point out to anyone. For the, for the monsters, it would be. Um, I'm going to counter there is a better piece of design in this yeah. game than the HL deck. And that is the gear and affinity system, which is yeah. the best new equipment system we have had since the old classic hand, 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 body, feet, helmet support stuff, which is the <laughs> classic um, in like Descent and Warhammer Quest. Suddenly go in and saying, hey, you have these nine slots and you can do what you want with them and you're probably going to put some armor in most of them and a weapon in another but maybe you won't perhaps you'll be a naked bow dude because you don't want to waste time with armor when you can just have a whole bunch of arrows and tell your mate to stand in the way of the monster it and it would have been interesting by itself but affinities and puzzle affinities that is just yeah, it's a really meaty, really good system, and it's the biggest failing of every boss battler that has followed on from Kingdom Death, in my opinion, is they've not looked at this and gone, "We should, we should. This is innovative. We should look at this because player base engages with this so much." Um, and they they go backwards to um, descent, you know, slots. Yeah, um, like yeah, they they all do that. I think that is also maybe a, a fear of seeming too much like they are getting inspired by Kingdom Death because this is kind of the thing that defines Kingdom Death on top of the HL deck. It, sure. No, the, I'd, so the thing is, mechanically maybe, but um, you can't copyright mechanics. Oh, yeah, no. The, I, I, I'm not saying that they shouldn't. I'm just saying that... I, yeah. I know you are. I'm just, I'm just highlighting the fact that... Um, it's fine for board games to iterate on previous designs. Otherwise, we'd have, what, chess, uh, Pokedex, and Settlers of Catan, uh, maybe Carcassonne, and that would be it, because there will yeah. be copyright. Right? Oh, yeah, you, you can't have a, so, an orthogonal grid in which you, <laughs> you move your character on, because that's like chess. There you go. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, that, that's my point. Uh, but I, I do think that others could look at not necessarily copying this 3x3 three three grid and colour matching system, but giving players more freedom... Um, of how they're going to put stuff in uh, it would be super interesting but everybody shy yeah. away from that perhaps because it's actually really complicated to design yeah. you've got to think about so many more things um, another yeah. hard thing that Kingdom Death does very well and that is uh, also done by another game uh, that you, you love then is um, uh, tags and keywords just like in uh, Magic the Gathering uh, it's not the first game to, to do it, but Magic the Gathering is kind of known to have a system of tags for uh, different action and powers that is yeah, so yeah. very hard to do. It's very hard to make them consistent and to make sure that when a player reads an ability on a card, they know how it will work and how it will interact with other things. And Kingdom Death does it very well, not perfectly. There's a lot of interactions that are a bit weird, but thankfully, since the game is not that uh, rigid uh, it's often something that you just decide at the table uh, but that on top of abilities just means that every single gear that you are allowed to craft becomes something that's part of a recipe to make your survival stronger and to build yeah. combos that are incredibly satisfying and as always when a new card is revealed there's always a part of my mind that look at the, the ability the keyword the affinities and is like 
well, maybe I could use this in combination with that gear and that gear, and it could then allow me to do insta wounds for free or to allow me to get like five more strength on every attack because I have this ability that kind of breaks the way that the game works and, and gives me this power on top of it. And that is something that is incredibly fun to think of and to play with the game and something that kind of goes against the whole idea of the game because the game you're supposed to struggle a bit but once you get good at how the mechanics and the systems and everything function you realize that no this game is not about struggling this game is about uh having an attack that does infinite strength on mm -hmm. on every hit and building survivals that can punch through uh god basically yeah, yeah. Um, TV Tropes, I think, originally mentioned it. That one of the concepts of this game was eventually you go and punch God in his genitals. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I yeah, I would say, like, magic um, definitely innovated this whole keyword and ability thing for absolutely sure. And it's great to have a word that you look at that is shorthand for maybe even a paragraph of text or more. Um, I really, like, Kingdom Death has keywords and abilities, and I really like keywords in particular in that they sit there and they're very innocuous and then you're there with your cool fancy double-handed battle axe and then um, like the monster bites your hand off and you look and you go, oh wait, I can't use this anymore. <laughs> Oh, well, I guess it's kicking and biting time until I get home. This sucks. Oh, um, it's it's boring. really neat. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, dear. My, my, my. Well, I smeared myself in grease. How was I to know that this creature who uses fire as a weapon was going to evaporate it away? Yeah. It's 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 fun to see those. Um. And gradually you learn to be aware of them or not. Uh. That's that's really joyful. But I mean, um. I as I say, Alessio. Uh. Your like, what is your like favorite non-monster related part of the game outside of the ones you already mentioned? Yeah. The modularity. I think that the thing I love more about this game is the way you can play it. You can basically mix and match everything else. And it's beautiful. I, I, uh, the affinities are actually a big part of this. And you talked about this. But uh, he, he just think about the fact that you could have a lot of overpowered equipment, but you cannot have it online at the same time on the same survivor, everything, because uh, you won't have the affinities. And if you go for prismatic to have more affinities or all the affinities you need, you will probably end up with, well, uh, actually, uh, no armor, but uh, it won't be the same after expansions or uh, after campaigns of that. So probably that won't go for that. But uh, this game is incredibly modular and it has a way of limiting itself uh, because even if you get uber powerful and you will get uh, uh, uber powerful uh, survivors, they, they won't last forever. They will still die occasionally, both on events and on unpredictable situations during a showdown. This game has a way of limiting itself while allowing you to do and experiment everything else. So, that's yeah, I, I would, I, yeah, I just like to um, bounce off that and say this is where I'm pretty confident in guessing that Adams played Blood Bowl because yeah. <laughs> Blood Bowl really does have that same thing of where you have got a lot of turnover. You're putting um, like players coming out of your team because injuries will remove them, and you're more about the team as a whole. Once you get quite experienced with Blood Bowl, is that how's the team doing? <laughs> the, and the individual players, you can't get massively attached to them, but you get to do cool combos of skills together in different player types. Um, so that's pretty uh, fascinating, and again, it's like it's definitely a Games Workshop influence on Kingdom Death Monster. Um, but I think Kingdom Death Monster is all the better for the pieces of of Games Workshop that it's iterated from, um, for definite. Uh, as, yeah. So um, I, that, the other thing I really like and of yours is um, the modularity. 
how you can change the texture of what weapons you want to use by changing the monsters. So if you add the Dung Beetle Knight, suddenly clubs and pickaxes and shields have an extra use that they didn't have before. Or if you add the Gorm, then suddenly you've got really good daggers and really good axes you get um, you know, that you weren't expecting to have in, if you were playing with a different setup. And then you can have like the difference in your experience once you add in spidiculus and replace the antelope like that that spidiculus is very nearly one of the best expansions it's just held back by a couple of things that might get addressed in campaigns of death or not it but will I get a campaign don't think any <laughs> yeah i don't think anyone could ever say that uh it doesn't like it, it has a bad showdown it's so different it's so well done it's so clever um, that it, it's I love fighting against it. I hate the thing uh, <laughs> with a passion, but I I always relish fighting it because it's so different. And that's it's annoying that everything else just drags it down. Um... Yeah, it's I would say everything else, but I would say there's a few bits and pieces that could have been more refined. And that's the thing that I'm most excited about the Gambler's Chest is we see like this is this was their first attempts. And um, so many of them are actually home runs. Uh, and you only get to like issues when you really start getting into the weeds of stuff or you want to do weird things. Um, I'm, and I, I'm personally, um, and I may as well, like, I'm just going to like go fully mask off for a moment. Um, when I write, I write about the best things that you can do. But I don't write about the best things you can do for the sake of saying... Um, this is all you should do. I do it. I, I do it. In fact, anyone who's watched me play a campaign or played with me knows that I am incredibly chaotic in the actual gameplay um, because I, I'm there for the fun. But I was trained to analyze laws and loopholes and everything. And, and that's part of my nature. So I look at game systems and I'm like, how can I break this? And then I do it. And then sometimes I'm like, oh, it's not fun anymore. So I'm not going to do that again. Or I'll be like, cool, I can apply this and do something else fun um, elsewhere. So uh, I, I like I write about the the the, the optimal things to do, um, but I don't follow those a lot of the time. I use it as a foundation. I'm I'm of the opinion if you have two or three well made survivors who are a boring meta and you and they've got like raw raw hide and some boring stupid deadly weapon they get to do all the hard work so then you can get a goofball on your squad who's like running around with like bad daggers or a whip or something um just just because i like whips and daggers cello. and i don't get to use them enough yeah or the cello yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> just for those fun things and that's what i'm here for is i firmly think that it's a cooperative game. It's about having fun and everybody should pick what makes things most fun for them. And for me, it's having a couple of things do all the boring grunt work so I can do stupid stuff with the others. Yeah, you know, I could go like four shutdowns without rolling a single silver injury during the first part of the game. Then I roll a single head injury and it's always head explosion. Oh, head explosion, Always. head hunter, head, head hunter is such a well designed ability <laughs> for monsters. Yeah, you go untouched for like six turns, then you get uh, that hit. Okay, let's brush it off. It's an explosion. I, I... Yeah. So um, we have a little bit of time before um, Alessio needs to go. So shall we get briefly through? Um, lightning round thoughts on the um on the core game monsters and um where, how good you think they are so i'm just going to speak for all of us i think we all agree the white lion is incredibly well designed it is a perfect teaching monster yeah it, it, yeah it's an incredible learning monster it um, doesn't scale well and... to the upper level but i don't think it needs to yeah. Um, it it doesn't need it, to. My my only complaints are land with a few pieces of gear, but they 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 like kind of niche. Yeah. Or um, and then there's a lot of people who complain about the cat's eye circlet. Um, but you don't have to. Yeah, it, I you know? I would say though the the um, the first armor that you get should be better than it is because it is the first armor that a lot of players are going to jump into getting, and the problem is that it's kind of a trap because it's not designed for first time players. 
Uh, yeah, we've seen a number of attempts to make the White Lion armor set stronger from different options. Um, I've always maintained it just needs an extra armor point to every location, and either you put that on the pieces or you put that on the armor set itself, yeah. and then you've still got difficult affinities to put together. Uh, anyway, um, so White Lion, I think, is the best of the three quarry monsters in the core game. Yeah, probably. Is that fair? Yes, probably. of course. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And then... Uh, where are we on the second best? Because we, so we've got the antelope the and the phoenix. Yeah. Which the one? Phoenix. Which one's second best? Antelope, but they have reserves. Phoenix. It's phoenix, phoenix for me. It's, I hate it. Yeah. It is really fun to fight. And if a couple of cards were slightly different, it would be one of the most fun fights uh, of I, the I, entire game. Yeah, I don't consider phoenix for deja vu, basically. Yeah, um, well, I mean, you have to remember that for most people, Deja Vu lives down the back of their sofa, so <laughs> yeah. it's not a problem for the average player. But yeah, Deja Vu is a bit of a problem. A couple of the gear cards in the Phoenix are a bit sort of, it's hard to get a good use out of them, but the personality of the Phoenix is, is Absolutely. phenomenal. I'm, many many people, when I recorded The Great Game Hunters with Twist, uh, many people still mention how much fun we had with the Phoenix because it is... Is such a cool twist on the classic Phoenix. And for me, I can't put Screaming Antelope ahead of it because that thing's had so many revisions and it's still got problems. It has my favourite gear card in the entire game in it. Um, I absolutely love... No, no, that's the Phoenix. Yeah. I'm talking about Screaming Antelope. Blood Pain, Blood man. Pain is great. I'm a bruiser all the way. Sword and board. That's my favourite play style. It, Sword. It is, give, give it me, is so good. Give me a leather armour... And a one-handed weapon and a leather shield and blood paint, and I am... That is so good, and that should be an all dual wield weapon function, just a, an innate blood paint for the same weapon. It's how it should work, and it's so sad it does not. Yeah, it's that's one of the things, paired weapons and two-weapon fighting. It's wonky in most games. Like It's a difficult thing to get right in any kind of, any kind of game. Um, Monster Hunter does it by just treating dual weapons as just being kind of one and the same yeah. thing. Yeah, the, I, like one entity. But King, Kingdom Death, it would work well because it has a self-limiting aspect in the, the way that uh, speed dice function. In any case, that's that's Absolutely. not that's not uh, what we are going to litigate today. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, the speed issue is an interesting one, um, and uh, I think the community's agreed. Agreed, you go between one and three dice, and occasionally you go to four or higher if you've got a really specific and goal. Or if you like rolling dices. <laughs> yeah, well, um, that's one of the things I'm I'm recording about the bone um, bone smith right now. Like literally, I was doing it this morning, and one of the things is. Uh, uh, statistically and mechanically bone darts are the best yep. choice yep. but I hate using them I hate rolling one dice and doing nothing and I need a dice cup to roll one dice because just rolling one dice in your hand is like what am I flopping my hand about for there's no do, 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 there's no nice noise well, so I always prefer swords I, I, know, I, just for the two I know who you are between the hare and the tortoise <laughs> me? Yeah. I'm, a, I'm a tortoise you don't like slow Absolutely and steady tortoise. you just said it <laughs> no, I I'm a tortoise in that I, I am a I am a frontline tank or bruiser <laughs> by nature. I that think is not playing a damage fable dealer walks. glass cannon, a bit, playing a, a damage dealer glass cannon is the most boring thing I can think of. I want to be right there in the front line and uh, mixing up. And you know, every every game I've ever played, I'm my happiest with a moderately heavily armored character who is hitting and taking hits. That's well, I must my, have had a my very different childhood book because in mine, the tortoise was not taking hits. <laughs> um, He did. He took hits all the way. He never stopped. So... He just keeps going. The hare is like a DPS character who like fires off a load and then has to stop and have a breather because it's too much aggro or they've used their resources. <laughs> Whereas the tortoise is just like, here's my shell <laughs> and boom, boom, boom. Do you see that? I obviously interpreted the book differently to you, the, the fable. Uh, so, <laughs> Nemesis wise, uh, who is the yes, best Nemesis um, of the core game? Butcher. Uh, good question. Butcher, yeah, definitely. Um, it, it, and, I will say second place goes to the final Nemesis and third place goes to the final Nemesis. I'm not sure in which order I put mm -hmm. them, but they're both like one of them is the, should we call it the, the halfway boss? It's not really halfway, but the. The, the original boss, um, the Watcher, is amazing thematically. It is yeah. such a... It's a real event. It felt like the accumulation of the campaign. And then the fight is not fun. Yeah. Uh, 
I think the fight's nearly fun. Yeah, but um, it's way too no, easy. By the time the, you get there, it's it should be it harder. It can be, yeah. Well, I mean, it's tough because when you know what you're doing, it's easy. And when you don't know what you're doing, um, you get your, your ass taken off and stuck on your head like a hat after your brain's been scooped out. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the Gold Smoke Knight is... Um, that's the thing. The Watcher is thematically stronger, um, but it, and but maybe mechanically weaker. And the Gold Smoke Knight is thematically like it's, super weak. It's almost entirely not in the plot yeah. um, of the game, uh, which I know Adam has admitted he possibly should have done more on that I, front. And the Gold Knight, Smoke Knight, super was, interesting if you know the law. I was really expecting um, Adam to use the GC to kind of build onto the Gold Smoke Knight's uh, lore and story, and he did not. Did, I don't. I wonder well, if he'll do it in the um in campaigns of death because you know he wanted to tell a different story i I think like the gc is specifically excluding the kingsman you can't have the kingsman in it so there's definitely some law stuff going on we'll we'll have to Um, see that yeah the gold smoke the actual the actual gold smoke night battle is freaking amazing it's so so very good um yeah but but no doubt about it butcher's the best butcher is butcher Butcher is the best and butcher scales with every level it feels like a really cool fight and a really hard one i invincible obviously not going to to spoil the mechanic but the 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 trait of the i mean it's a seven years old game but uh the... yeah it, it's a it's a, it's a frustrating one at times um but it, it does all, do all the job all was, was a nightmare and a nemesis should be an event and it should be something that feels hard and complicated and kind of a checkpoint every time yeah the kingsman I... uh i really like the law and uh the thematics of it i think that the fight is quite boring um yeah it, i call it adventures in spreadsheeting at level two or higher yeah. yeah um but but at least i had finally had the absolute joy of fighting the kingsman um it was last year and i had a survival with altered destiny after he got Ooh. uppercutted by the dragon king and that was fun i got to play with the flash for a, <laughs> for a showdown fight <laughs> It was it was literally like, what are you going to do to me, Kingsman? Because I'm over here in the corner and you're over there, and I'm dashing over to punch you and then leaving again. <laughs> that was that was sweet. That felt really cathartic. Um, I did want to say before we do go to the the hand. Um, I, I believe the butcher is Adam's creation. I've never found out specifically who did it, but I'm pretty sure it's an Adam special. And everything about it's amazing i even love that it turns up unannounced oh, yeah. it feels weird to players until you work out what it is and what tropes it is and what it's doing it is it's the best monster in the box Possibly, yeah yeah uh, i think yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, it's always uh, a, it's always a, it's my opinion it's no my no opinion. Yes. it's the best monster yes. box but yeah yeah so um, yeah uh, while the butcher is the best nemesis in the game, the hand is my favorite one. Yeah. It, with, with one caveat, there's two cards that need to be inverted because they thematically feel so much stronger if they are the rewards for the biting for uh, beating the end. There's there's two different ways to win the fight. If those cards are inverted, the hand thematically feels a hundred times uh, stronger and feels so much more fun to fight because the most rewarding way to fight it is not to fight it and just wait it uh wait until the the hand is done trying to use you as a punching ba- bag and that does not feel fun that is a horrible yeah. way to engage with the nemesis uh yeah, the, yeah it's um it's it's very much a case where the thematics of the fight are super super cool but when you get down to the practicality of it after your first couple of encounters it, it, it the shine does rub off a little bit um i'm interested because i know there's some changes that are Me happening too. to the hand in respect to the gambler's chest um i believe it's actually getting a new ai card at least one for the gambler's chest encounters with it and it's going to be the like star of the gambler's chest along with the gambler <laughs> um so there may be some people already well, listening um who have the gambler's chest who hello uh you may know more than we do about this um but yeah, yeah, the the hand is uh, definitely the one that loses out the most the more you face it. But it's still, I I, I can't be angry with him because he's really. Cool. I think that if you and, if you just fight it as a no, as a straight ma- fight, uh, it's th- good. He make he makes people of the stars easier for me yeah. as well, and I bless him. For yeah, that. the hand has that uh, duration card, the slap, <laughs> when he just points to the ground. 
flow, <laughs> then you must, yeah. you must yeah. play the survivor in the sweet spot, otherwise you get the penalty, and then it slaps mm-hmm. you, and that's beautiful. Yeah, there's there's the one where I think he finger pokes someone across yeah. the board as well. Yeah, the 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 thematics of it are absolutely um, just so so amazing for sure. And and that the of course the critical hit to the groin. Yeah. Where yeah. if you have enough understanding, your character goes, "This guy's pulling his punches. This guy's pretending this hurts." It's, I love this. Yeah. It's like. Yeah. The, the, yeah, the hand yeah. is such a powerful monster to to face and it feels powerful and that's where the like every monster that you that you you face they are going a hundred percent they are fighting you at the the most strong that they can't the hand does not and it feels like it is pulling punches with you yeah and that's well that's um good. alessio is gonna have to leave us in yeah. roughly a couple of minutes so alessio uh you got the floor for final words and then alexis and i'll probably talk about the expansion monsters a little bit so go ahead <laughs> okay uh if you want to talk a bit about expansions i just give you the start with saying that uh, there is a lot uh, interesting stuff in expansions and that's where that's where the game probably exploits its uh, modularity the most because uh, just the two big campaigns you get from the expansions change the game a lot and they are beautiful for that and uh, of course uh, probably everyone knows but or, or not maybe not but my favorite expansion is the damn beetle knight just because of the level of preparation and the fact that the shutdown is basically facing a two-dimensional combat because of the ball and uh, of course there are among the favorites the most common favorites and that i can to eat the flower knight there was a time when uh, cantus doctor and uh, uh, Vesper Time Bow coupled with the uh, new counterweighted axe, uh, which basically guaranteed you to 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 always wound on a 10. Actually, you always did that, but with the ease of getting the bone which you could get uh, it basically most assured without all the downsides. There was uh, a moment when the, all the meta of the game was defined by the Flower Knight, basically. And that was the lowest point in the history of Kingdom Death uh, community playing. And that's basically it. I think uh, I, I finished here my my segment. So, <laughs> so. Mm-hmm. yeah, um, I, to comment on what you're saying, uh, Dungeon Knight isn't my favorite, but I totally get why you like Beetle LeBron James. <laughs> uh, he, he's, he, it is a really cool fight. It's, it's definitely also one of the really yes. re- well rounded out. Uh, monsters in the game like there's a lot of uh lore and stories and the the legendary dung beetle knight which we've all affectionately <laughs> named tom um because he's called the old master which is t-o-m um so i i, I love that I love, I love that. I'm not sure if I coined him as Tom or I picked it up from somewhere else, but it always makes me really happy <laughs> that, that it is a great is, surname. It, pe- it is it is a great abbreviation, and he does kind of feel like a Tom man. That, that story's a heartbreak. It's yeah. really yeah. like you know. Um, we know that Zachary Barash fixed the Dung Beetle Knight to make the showdown work as well as it does, but the the original concepts and writing are that's Adam, and he's like I said, he can knock it out of the park when he wants to. And the Dung Beetle Knight is, um, I'd say, it's a couple of home runs. <laughs> it would be more than that, but the ball's pretty heavy. Yeah, so. <laughs> it's it's not a home run. It's a it's a three point. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh god! When are we going to get a baseball-related monster? Okay. Um, well, the um, uh, the screaming no, um, the nightmare run is going to be a. Uh... Isn't that volleyball? It's volleyball. Isn't it? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, I, I was thinking more of a monster that just like I don't know pulls bits off itself and sm- <laughs> hurls them at you, or or, or um, re- re- sends your projectile weapons back at it. We don't have a lot of anti-range stuff. Anyway. Um, uh, I'm where Alessio has pressed yeah. the time, so you've finished everything you'd like to say. Thank so, you so thank you very much for being with us for this, Alessio. Uh, and um, we'll catch you for a normal recording when we're doing that. So, everyone, uh, this is this is um, the first part. Uh, Alessio is going to leave us now. So, yeah, uh, you have the floor. See to you, see you next time. Uh, take care, Alessio. Yeah.
Yep. All right, all right. Bye, Alessio. Bye bye. Okay, so with Alessio gone, Alexis and I are going to chat a little bit longer um, about some other bits and pieces. And we're going to have a second part to this as well with Audrey. Um, so that will be coming out soonish. Very but soon. anyway, Alexis, you had a lot more you wanted to say. Um, and we just tried to give Alessio some space to talk. Um, yeah, since he was it. pressed by time. He was pressed, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I, I mostly I mostly wanted to say that um, I think that the core game, I, I touched on that a little bit earlier, I think that the core game was made without really a thought on how the game would expand and how the expansion would uh, lop onto it. And because the ga- the core game is such a massive um, beast, it's, it's $400, 420 now, um, and it is so attached to this original story that ends with the watch the watcher and has sort of a thematic uh of the king's coming uh that is brushed on but not fully formed because the lantern festival never came in it always felt a little bit um unachieved uh totally and i'm very curious about uh the upcoming gc's way to address that because it is going to be another $400 box uh, that is going to bring so many new polished mechanic that the core game was missing because I from what I've seen I I tried not to uh, look at too many stuff since the game is coming very soon oh Uh, I've I've got spies I've looked at everything (laughs) even stuff in discords that I'm not in I've seen it all um I, I've tried to keep my eyes a little bit away from from too much of it because I I I will be just scrolling through everything once I have the 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 box here. But I'm wondering how well it will uh, touch those parts and how the game is going to be after that because the old expansion don't have the same. Uh, Tots put in as the new monster are going to to have uh, you know they, they don't have pattern cards they don't have uh philosophies or, or knowledge cards or all of the new fangled uh mechanics coming into the the gc so i'm wondering if for a while the kingdom death is going to be in this weird in between uh waiting for cod uh which is going to happen at some point uh in the next decade yeah it, it could do um i think that this box was a big roadblock for the guys and now they've got it through I, i'd imagine i'm gonna i'm gonna optimistically speculate that we'll be hearing about campaigns of death shipping sometime next year um maybe with some of the finished monsters as well i really expect to see more momentum coming um i am sure that adam wants to put this lot to bed and get on with the next thing that he wants to do and i really hope he does labyrinth because uh, I I um, want I want to go to the Holy Lands and smack some blessed in the uh, in the face. I'm expecting COD for like 2025 or something like early 2025. No, oh, um, I'm 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 optimistic now. I am. I'm back on back on the the train. Um, <laughs> although oh. you know when I'm not reviewing stuff, which I have to do, uh, you know you have to critique stuff when you're reviewing stuff, and I'm just engaging with it as a consumer. Um, I'm I, I you know, I'm very very excited about what's oh coming. same yeah I, uh, uh, the, I I'm very excited about the GC and for all of the feelings that I have for regarding uh, Adam and the the way that he runs this campaign uh, the GC seems to have really good content in it it's just a it shame does. that it took so long but yeah yeah well it I will mean, be there so yeah yeah I I've maintained that the GC should have been a separate Kickstarter. But um, that yeah. is water under the bridge now, and it's delivering. Well, and um, I think it is probably going to demonstrate and show how much these guys have grown since they released the first game. You know, they were working on this initially over a decade ago. And as he, as we said, Adam wasn't a board game designer at that point, and he achieved something really incredible um, for his first board game. And they, I think they've all grown. And a big part is they've also seen how we have played as the community. Yeah. I, I know we've done stuff that they did not even comprehend while they were designing. And that's what happens when you design something. You can't cover everything. 
So yeah. um, I especially I look when forward, it's your first game. Absolutely, I look forward to when they touch back on the original stuff in Campaigns of Death and what they do for that. Um, and I really yeah. look forward to the newer designs because I mean, I asked for the Lotus Monster. I I remember during the Kickstarter, I tweeted at Adam and said I would be really disappointed if the Lotus Monster is not in there. And I've seen a full size sculpt of it, a picture of that. So. Um, yeah, she's in there, and I'm really excited about that. Uh, and I'm the inverted mountain, I love as well. But I, I, I was always like, the gambler's chest needs to be really good. It needs to be really, really good, um, and it needs to. They need to have shown growth and development as designers. And I'm tentatively going to say they have, and I'm tentatively going to say that this might be one of the best releases of the year. Um, yeah, for. I mean, regardless if the GC is good or not, this is going to be one of the best releases of the year because it's 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 a massive box that is uh, five years coming, and I paid it for fifty dollars. So uh, <laughs> it's got it's it, got the crimson croc in it. Remember, but, yeah, exactly. Um, we should probably get back to uh, yeah. finishing so, retrospective on those. So we'll speaking start with, of GC of the, the we'll, COD. We'll do, yeah, we'll do, we'll do um yeah we'll do the expansions in timeline order. So this is when they turn up on your timeline. Uh, we've touched a little bit on them with Alessio, but we start with um, a perennial favourite, and that is the Gorm, which is a combination of an anglerfish, a baby, a elephant, and alchemy. Yeah, and it is a fan favorite for a very good reason because early game since the um, screaming antelope is kind of a weak monster a lot of people fight well not weak in terms of, of why you would want to fight it uh, a lot of people fight the lion so many times especially since the phoenix is not that attractive and there's not that many game in the core set so the gorm just brings so much fresh air into the first 10 years of your timeline and even after that because it's a monster that has so many good crafting uh, elements that can be good for a whole campaign. Like there are uh, pieces of the GOM uh, uh, crafting sheets that you will still bring, uh, will want to make late into the campaign. And that is really strong. I think that it's the monster that uh, works the best in each of its level. Like level one is yeah, it's... very important. The level two is great. Level three is amazing. Like all of the, all of them work and work at the time that you can fight them. I'm going to give it second place um, behind yeah. one we'll get to later. But I absolutely do agree that it is a phenomenally well-designed monster with very few issues. There's a few. Um, we'll see what they do in Campaigns of Death to touch on those. I'm pretty yeah. sure they will. But um, this is you know this is the Anna Poot special, and it is it, the the references to every single different aspect are so great. Like the this is one of the monsters we see the whole life cycle for, and it's very much like an elephant's life cycle. They roam around until they get in heat, and then they like congregate in dens where you can encounter their young and slaughter their young for bits because that's what the survivors do because they're monsters. Yeah. Um, and then you encounter them at the end of their lifespan in the fabled like Gorm graveyard, um, like an elephant graveyard. It's really well done. I love that uh, it's the first one that introduces like a prestige drop weapon. If you death blow it, you can get the pure bulb and you can turn the pure bulb into a riot mace. And a riot mace is so good you can use it all campaign, which is yeah. that's a really fun event when it happens. Yeah. The one thing that I find a little bit too bad about the Gorm is that the Black Sword is way too easy to get, and it's a weapon that kind of um, shines through all of the other weapons and can kind of take the, the spotlight of a campaign mm. if you go for it. I would uh, say if you, if you don't do um, Vagabond stuff, Vagabond armor being the promotional armor that gives yeah. you benefits to Sword Mastery, if you just do it normally... Um, it is it's a very fair weapon because unless you get an ageless sword um, proficiency survivor it takes a long time to build up to that ridiculous blade and it feels earned um, there so I think in isolation it's really cool um, and I love I love the sword synergies between the Gorm and the Flower Knight and everything the, the way the under the Sunstalker the way all those things tie into this cool swords campaign um but yeah if you played the seven swordsman you could go get yourself a black sword and everybody in your settlement's mm -hmm. a sword master so it does yeah it's something that you can 
robust. I would personally more say that the bigger issue um, lands in the armor set that's still a bit lost in what exactly you're trying to do with it. Um, nobody has come up with a really satisfying place where the gorma, gormant armor is um, really good. Uh, it's always it is just kind of with. yeah. It's it, the trouble I think for me is that you get a four slot armor set, which is super interesting. Yeah. Um, but then it wants a shield to use its ability, and it wants specific affinities that it can't supply itself. So you end up having to do a whole load of things to get it working, and suddenly it's not a four slot armor piece. It's like six or seven slots just to get it all working. Um, yeah. It does have a really good, um, fun main ability with the idea of hitting, scoot, um, hit, scooting and shooting, shooting and scooting where you hit and then you retreat with your shield. Um, and also the mask, the Gormant mask is one of the best headgear in the game. So there's a lot there. I think if they changed a little bit about the Gormant armor's affinity and maybe the set bonus, um, it would be a slam dunk. Um, it's definitely... When I use, I actually often use an archers because it's nice to have a four slot armor set on an archer and have an extra slot for arrows or equivalent. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. And uh, I think the alchemy stuff's amazing. Uh, the, oh yeah, the, the alchemy is great, and the, I will love any monster that comes with like a secondary crafting location with a different mechanic. That's just. Yeah, Maybe. it's a really fresh and unique mechanic where you spend organs to roll dice on a chart, and initially you roll two d six. And then you get to um, make more innovations, like based off the alchemy of Negredo, Albedo, Citranus, and Rubedo. Um, I might pronounce the last one wrong. It's a while since I did my alchemy. Um, and uh, you get more and more dice, and you can even throw old potions that you've made into there to get re-rolls. It's, it's a fun, controlled piece of randomness, and it's got some great outcomes. Some of them could have done with more affinities, because um, a edge case item that saves you if you die is not particularly stunning if it doesn't at least give you some utility with affinities, but it is on the whole great. Um, yeah, the, the Gorm is like a 9 out of 10 expansion for me, and um, a few tweaks, it'd be 10 out of 10. Uh, and the, uh, you, final words on Gorm? Uh, yeah, uh, for, for me, it's my fourth favorite expansion, uh, just because uh, the other three uh, above that are, I spend way more time with them uh, playing with, with the game, and I will, uh, I think that the early game with the lion works really well if you by itself, but the gorm is, is definitely like one of the best, uh, and, and just taken by itself without a uh, um, having to decide which one you, you would add to a campaign or which one you would uh, buy first, the Gorm is, is uh, yeah, like a 9 out of 10 easily. Yeah, it really, is. Really, really, really strong. It is. It's worth mentioning before we move on that one of the, you get so much from the Gorm. Uh, the downside is you get a thing called Gorm Climate, which has a chance of destroying resources every turn until you build, I think, build a hovel. No, no. Hovel. It, it, a hovel, yeah, can protect yeah. the stuff. Um, that's actually not as big a downside as it seems because in the early game you should be spending all your resources every year anyway. Yeah. Or mostly doing that. So it's it's just an interesting thing you have to learn to deal with. Um, then it brings us on to our Lantern Year 2 expansion monster, Spidiculous, um, who has we just reached the KDM simulator, uh -huh. uh, which I'm going to talk about at the end of this. Oh, yeah. Um, do, don't you want to talk uh, with it uh, on Friday with Audrey? Oh, we, we can no, talk no. about it. Audrey, Audrey said they're not that interested okay. in the KDM yeah. simulator, so I'm just going to wrap the end of this with a talk about uh, what the KDM simulator's that, done. That, um, that definitely yeah. works. Uh, yeah. I, well, as you mentioned earlier, the Spidiculous Shadow is amazing. It's, it's one of the strongest uh, in the game. It also has minions, and I think the best use of minions in, uh, in Kingdom Death. I'm not a big fan of the way that uh, Sunstalker used them, as we'll talk about later. Um, Spediculus is really, really go uh, good to fight. I think that the uh, events that come with it, the fact that uh, when you fight the Spediculus, you kind of have to fight it uh, later on, is uh, frustrating because you don't have the full time in your timeline. And it's not a monster that you want to fight that many times because of its... Uh, lackluster ge uh, gear but it is so fun to fight and it's such a big uh, difference from other uh, monsters yeah so to touch on the lackluster gear uh, 
portion. The issue is that many of the weapons you get from Spidiculus are like alternate versions of what you get from the White Lion. Uh, Spidiculus is replacing um, the Screaming Antelope, um, so it's designed to work alongside the uh, White Lion, but it has many overlaps. Then there's the other thing, which is the armor set is about leather in tier. Um, it's interesting because it's awkward to position it correctly, but it provides a lot of affinity. So you, it's modular to be yeah. built in different ways. The problem's always been that the silk turban requires you killing a level three spidiculus. And I'm not going to beat around the bush. That thing is no slouch. Um, so it kind of pushes the armor set quite late in the campaign. You need to be fairly powerful before you go in to face a level three spidiculus. And um, you don't have a full silk set. And not having an armor bonus in Kingdom Death is it. It you've got to be really um, on the yeah. ball, so especially a... not having something on your on your head. Like yeah. you have to build a different part of the of the set, and that spot will never be really used because you don't have a full set. It's just it's a bit weird. Yeah. I, I tend to put a skull helm on, and then make yeah. exclusive in like heavy use of the two gain one armor point to all location abilities. It's quite hard to get a build where both of them are active. But it, it has also gen- feels... the boots. Are, the boots are really good. Yeah, it also feels a bit awkward because you cannot activate the entire armor by itself. Yeah, um, I, I'm kind yeah. of okay with that because it is interesting and it looks like the upcoming Smog Singers set is going to have a similar issue. So it makes it makes it modular, but I know what you mean. It mentally hurts. It it would be it would be more interesting if you had to choose between two bo- uh, two bonus that kind of made sense that you have to either activate one or the other and that they both like kind of complement themselves uh, not complement themselves kind of um mimic themselves but it doesn't feel like it was intended uh, in the yeah in the gear. yeah um uh, like, and yeah, yeah 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 so the armor set's a bit wobbly it's it's like most monster armor sets they they usually well, like we didn't talk about the screaming antelope one much which has been all over the place it's been yeah. too weak <laughs> stupid, too, strong, too powerful too... and now it's kind of like you use it with spears and maybe not anything else i've i've had a couple of builds that do stuff with screaming armor i like the amount of affinities it has and it's very self-contained but um, yeah, the other piece of um, like spiriculous that you could criticize is the silk bodysuit that feels Which like it wrong. should it should come from the level three. That's yeah. that, it genuinely feels it's amazingly fun and powerful, and it can make a leather armor set become end game gear or a yeah. silk armor set. But, but it does turn up really early, and you're like, whoa, this is whoa, yeah. oh boy. Um, but I think we have to definitely, no matter how you feel about what can be done with them the spidiculus cutting all its legs off and rolling it home and getting those rings really, really is fun. really cool and it's a lot of work to get those rings I, that's one thing I, people go all oh, the rings are stupidly strong and i'm like do you know how hard it is that's you've fine got get, yeah you've got to get multiple single drops there's only one copy of these you have to fight if you're lucky you might be able to make one ring from fighting three spidiculus if you're lucky and usually it's not that it requires work and effort and i think it's yeah it's a it's fair. a lot of it's a lot of investment and it's kind of a, a luck thing which one you're going to build. Like you can't decide that you're going to build one of them because you have no idea if those resources will pop up. It feels like a end game reward uh item, and that's perfectly fine. I think that's I think that's probably one of the the best uh like the most well crafted gear of the the Spidiculus. Yeah, it's uh, it's very itself. good. Um, the silk surgeon as well is amazing fun. It's very I hard mean, to get, but I really like the silk whip. Yeah, I love the no, I love the silk whip, except for the fact that it's just a better hunter's whip, and yeah, uh, we re- we really desperately need a whip to bridge the gap between yeah, them but... and get into the ring whip. I think that's also a big problem in a larger uh, sense with Node 2 monster, a quote-unquote around Node 2, which is basically the Screaming Antelope, the um, Spidiculus, and soon the um, uh, the, the, the song, song prawns. The, yeah, the, yeah, so- the song singers. prawns. Yeah. Smoke singers, that's the one. Uh, because the, the Spidiculus feels at the right uh, danger level, uh, like it's it's sufficiently hard to fight to to be interesting, but it kind of does feel like the gear is not that big of a step up from the the lion. It feels like it there's something that needs to be closer in strength with the weapon crafter, for example. Yeah, but I mean that's the problem with the weapon crafter is is some of the stuff doesn't feel like a step up from the white lion. 
Yeah, like but, but it's I, just I think a, that all of the early game up until year twelve or something has kind of a difficulty to find its niche, uh, power wise. Then we got the Manhunter. Manhunter, uh, absolutely amazing nemesis. The only problem is that it kind of replaces the Butcher. Well, I mean it doesn't, but you should replace the Butcher by the Manhunter, and the Butcher is already great on its own. It's a really fun nemesis to fight. It offers a lot of gear that can really change the way that you play with the the hunters that the the survivors that get those so the man hunter is like a also a really really high uh, it's one of the first expansions where it provides a piece of gear that is this is exclusively for using on the hunt and it's good enough thanks to the affinities it gets that you're like hell yeah i'm going to use this on the hunt with the sonorous lantern which you get very early Uh, it's a really amazingly fun and thematic piece of work from like it was it's based on the undertaker um who's of course one of the biggest legends of wrestling um and uh also it's got lots of like little pieces of uh, storytelling um when you pay attention to what it looks like uh, um you can tell where it's come from which um, has been confirmed in an interview that the manhunter comes from the holy lands and that fits in thematically with what we know of the holy lands and he has a a cool little lion face on his pistol. The, the gun, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And he also looks half-baked, the way that the people from the Holy Lands look. I also really like the War Room. Uh, it's a, an innovation that allows you to re-roll on the hand table. And I think that's, like, more mechanics like that, please. Like, more mechanics that allow you to mitigate luck on a strictly luck-based uh, part of the game. That that's just good design. That works well. It's a really good innovation to get at some point. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I I really love the Manhunter. Uh, then we yeah. have the other um, cohort from the Holy Lands, and that's the Second Lion Knight. So far, we've seen two of the three Lion Knights. Um, yeah. Some people did speculate that the Gold Smoke Knight was the third knight, but uh, yeah. like directly from Adam, we know the Gold Smoke Knight is something else. It's linked to the. Um, the land itself and linked to the civilization that came beforehand, which was a lion-based civilization. So we, we don't know who the Lion Knight... Um, is it Lion Knight th- third? Yes, the Lion Knight third. third. Yeah. So the, this is the Lion Knight second, and of all of the three Lion Knights, he's the one who's most obsessed with the survivors and that kind of stuff. And so he rides around pulling a carriage that is occupied by his three immortal scholarly... Um, uh, friend, uh, friends or associates who a I like. They, they, yeah, they are Sam, Ash, and Rand, and I like the androgynous nature of all their names. And they yeah. are—they're like really powerful immortals in their own right. Um, so it's it's really cool. Thematically, it's amazing. Um, it uh, brings yeah. us the hybrid armor sets, which is like an absolute hit with everyone. Which is armor sets where you plug different bits of kit from various different monsters together and then a new set pops out of it they're really cool i i really appreciate the lore and the thematic of the monster i think that's the best aspect and lore wise it's probably one of the best monster for the the way that it tells its story um the showdown is great it's a bit clunky because it introduced a lot of different rules and mechanics and it's very easy to to abuse them uh but it's a fun showdown. The biggest problem for me is the way that uh, the showdown um, aftermath works. Uh, because if you win against uh, the Lion Knight, you get penalized. And if you lose, you get slightly less penalized. And there's no really good way to interact with it. Yeah, thematically, it, it makes sense. Mechanically, it doesn't necessarily work out as well as it could have done. Um, and that's a shame. Uh, also, there's... If you want to, you can kind of break the showdown, um, which is more of a curio than anything else, because I'm not interested in breaking the showdown now that I know I can do it. Um, So ultimately, it's like all of the settlement stuff with the Lion Knight is amazing. The, 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 The fact that they all set up next door after the Lion Knight spins like ages just standing there silently observing. And it's a long time. He just doesn't move. Yeah, Um, He's clearly very... Uh, I, I don't think the story ends with him being carried off in a in a coffin, and I don't think he's really dead. I think it's a big like act again of him just playing up to it all, because um, he just seems he seems really strong, 
Yeah, um, for it does. sure. And um, a lot of personality as well. I think that's um, he's he he's another one that's very close to being like really good, which is why I think the new stuff we're going to get will be amazing because I, first I really attempt, hope so because. Know, yeah, for, for me, it's one of the expansion that hits the, the list for me. Uh, it's uh, at 10 out of 12 on my uh, my personal list. But like a lot of the expansion that I dislike uh, in Kingdom Death, they don't need that much work to be actually good. Uh, I think that uh, COD might bring it into light. But now we are going to talk about the one expansion that is uh, that needs a lot of work to be good and that is uh, definitely not good and actually kind of bad uh and i don't think it's fixable without a complete rewrite which is the floor night um mm. which happens in year eight i want to say five five eight, eight seven and eight is seven and eight is where the node three start turning up oh yeah uh, it it uh, arrives on node uh, node five, but it could arrive on during the prologue, and it wouldn't make a big difference because the floor knight uh, is a big pushover. The level one can be beaten by by naked survival, not too harshly if you know to, uh, how to play the game, and if you have four founding stone, you could beat it quite easily. Uh, the whole fight revolved around luck, which is a mechanic that is already incredibly strong. And the floor knight uh, is not that threatening. Uh, and the problem is that it's an incredibly rewarding fight because it gives you a lot of resources. It gives you new survivors uh, too, which can help you make a really strong uh, settlement. It's kind of in the community been seen as the uh, make the game easier monster, which could be a, a fun place to be. It's just a bit too bad that this monster is uh, not that fun to fight the uh, higher level are very fun to fight yeah, but, i was gonna say yeah. i think the the thing is is that for experienced players um if you're gonna play with it just leave it until you're gonna tackle it at level three and the level three is genuinely yeah uh, an interesting challenge um it is obviously a model that resonates with people it's got a oh, yeah. wonderful owl like appearance and a lot of feminine aesthetics it has a bustle made out of flowers and a big billowing robe and it echoes that whole um like the swashbuckling kind of uh knight type thing going on it's uh it, it's a really beautiful model it's another reason why the abyssal woods is probably really exciting for everyone yeah. i'm wondering if they're going to rebuild it um mechanically for the abyssal woods as a nemesis like as we want to assume it's the half like the the first big nemesis um, i i would hope we'll so because it feels like a nemesis it doesn't feel like a monster also that's something that i always start is that it's a knight it's built without a crafting location it has all of the uh highlights of a nemesis it could easily just be a nemesis and yeah kind of should have i think i think yeah. that if it was a nemesis and if it was slightly harder it would be uh way better than it is at the moment yeah um it, it's certainly got um areas it could improve and we, we'll yeah. see where it goes in the future it is i i've made my peace with it it's a good thing for newer players to experience with and learn and i think the changes to the vespertine bow have brought it to that spot where the vespertine vespertine bow is now like something you use if you want to do deadly shooting and you don't just use it under every single circumstance so that the extra cards that are introduced in 1.6 for it were a good move um we, we'll see uh i i definitely hope i agree it it's like the screaming antelope has some fundamental design issues that maybe at this point it's just not worth worrying about because yeah get on to new stuff maybe the better way to go about it and just accept them for what they are um so yep uh right well we can jump back up to a really high peak now um my vote for uh, I'm going to give it second place in Nemesis ranking, the second best Nemesis monster. 
Um, I think still, yeah, I think Butch is still better. Um, and that is the internet creepy past of Slender Man, which is themed about a dimensional invader that's come from another strange place filled with water and um, brambles and everything. And it's more or less looking to abduct people away. It has a lot of insanity mechanics and it is a replacement for the King's Man. And it is the King's Man's a brutally hard fight to go against its that's uh, the really good thing about the Kingsman but the Slenderman keeps that difficulty while also offering so much more so how do you feel about it? Brutally hard and not very fun to fight while the Slenderman is amazing to fight it's a fight that feels like it has a flow to it and a way to approach it and that once you know how the fight works you can mitigate it and bring specific ways to to uh play around it but you can never feel like you've cracked it and uh that the fight becomes boring like the slender man for me at least uh stay interesting all the time every level of it is interesting it's also uh the only i i am saying that with uh trying to think if there's a, another one that does that but it's the only uh, nemesis that has a crafting uh parts location kind of thing at the moment yeah at the moment and it's so good it works really well it means that fighting it is rewarding and it feels good all the time but also when it pops up and you're not ready for it it can be really scary and dangerous and the first few fights against it are really memorable uh it is it is my third favorite expansion it is my second favorite uh, nemesis because the butcher is still really really good uh the slender man is is hitting everything uh perfectly and i'm almost surprised that uh, adam never got a copyright notice from sony uh because uh somehow they could buy uh internet creepy pasta yeah i i don't think we need to worry about that it hasn't happened oh, no. so yeah, it doesn't happen yeah. i don't think it will happen but it's al always something that i find uh surprising but yeah yeah um i mean it's surprising that somebody actually owns the copyright to slender man that, uh, that so, is but... incredibly surprising i think that copyright laws are very much bullshit so this one is just uh another one for the weird ways that copyright exists yeah yeah um for myself i agree I love how difficult this monster is to fight, but it is always fair in its difficulty, um, and I never feel completely safe. Um, you're you sort of it's like I'm going to talk about it with the Dung Beetle Knight a bit later, but you're always on the edge of everything going catastrophically wrong, which yeah. um, puts it, it definitely makes this thing feel very tense um, to fight in a way that even as hard as the Dung Beetle Knight is or can be. The Dung Beetle Knight always feels a little bit goofy in the best possible way. Um, yeah. And Slender Man never feels goofy. Slender Man just feels threatening, which is weird because the actual Slender Man is super goofy. Like, Yeah, I, I think it's because the Dung Beetle Knight uh, feels like it use a bit too many mechanics sometimes. Like it tries to undo, undo itself with every cards and to have something something new with every cult that it pulls the slender man is way more feels way more uh homogeneous yeah it is it I, feels very me. focused and refined yeah and um it has some super cool gear and very powerful gear um but it, it and also i'm just going to say how much i love that it ties back into the original three quarry monsters by having gear that you can craft from stuff like you can finally use the lion's tail uh, from the white lion to make a set of braces and those braces actually turns out they have some really unique and exciting applications that you can do with them so that's super interesting as well um, yeah, we started talking about it though so um uh, you were going to say something I, I was just going to say that it's also really cool that uh, the gear that the slender man gives uh, allows you to re to to make completely new builds and do stuff that you couldn't before and push the game into a different direction and that's always super fun. Uh, but yeah, let's let's yep, talk yep. about let, let's, uh, let, let's everybody's just, favorite. Just for, no, yeah, in a moment. But just before we do the gloom hammer, yes, yes, we didn't talk about the gloom hammer and it's amazing and it's super interesting and it does so many weird and unique things. Um, so yeah, but the gloom hammer. Speaking of hammers, because the, they're clubs, we'll get onto uh, 
as uh, as Alexis just said, uh, a perennial favourite with everyone, as we were partially talking about it, our uh, Michael Jordan, the Dung Beetle Knight, who um, I believe I've given this story before, but I will just talk about it again. I, uh, Zachary Barash um, was handed the Dung Beetle Knight after Adam worked on it, and... Um, and was told, hey, uh, th- this thing here, we're having trouble. It kind of like throws the ball and then ignores it the entire time. Um, and it's not that's not what we want to do. Can you do something about it? And he stripped one of its abilities away and that landed on the Lion God, uh, which is called Rampage. And then he tightened it up so the Don't Be Tonight focused more on getting to its ball and using its ball. And the ball is definitely the most striking thing about this fight because it is a brutal attack that isn't really an attack like you can only evade this through clever positioning and dashing and stuff or by constantly keeping the dung beetle knight separated from the ball by pushing it away whenever it's next to it and that's that's why it's another fight where you constantly feel on the edge of just losing because if you mess up and leave the dung beetle knight next to the ball if ever, anyone's in range of adjacent to it within like two spaces um, including diagonals, they're just going to get run over for a ton of unavoidable damage. Um, I I kind of really love how it's a Power Rangers basketball. Oh yeah, it's it's beetle. Kamen Rider, but as a uh, as a beetle with a massive ball that plays it as if it was playing basketball. It's so weird. It's a really fun concept, and the miniature is. I think right behind the Florinite in terms of uh, captivating people's uh, imagination. Um, a lot of people really like the model. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's fantastic. I love the Black Harvest farming that it introduces. It's it's so good, the Calcifit gear. And once again, it brings some of the gear from the core game to be calcified to. Uh, it does some really interesting stuff. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I love the armor, I love the trash crown, I love the beetle bomb. It's one of the only good bombs in the game, the The, beetle bomb. Yeah. The river bone harness is also really strong uh, and really fun to play with. Uh, The scarab circlet is is, uh, also quite good, and it's something that I will bring often. It's it's a really fun monster. It's also a monster that is uh, hard the way that you fight it for the first time, and the level 2 and level 3s are powerhouses uh into pushing the game into places where you wouldn't expect it's incredibly strong incredibly fun to play with and it's really fun that you have a way to mitigate its damage and it's it's um in strength by by keeping the ball away and by trying to keep the the dung beetle knight slightly uh slightly more uh power down I, I really like that fight. I think that the but yeah. the, the DBK is just one of the best monsters in the game. It's also really interesting in that it can be the focus of everything you're looking for, but you can also, because the pieces of its set are so modular and they don't have locations, you can plug them onto any other armor set to kind of give it a bit more toughness and durability, which makes the Dung Beetle Knight one of those unique monsters that's both good to hunt repeatedly and as a sort of one-off splash quarry. Yeah. So yeah, uh, right on to um, we're going to talk about the, the we get, these are the two really big boxes, um, and the first one we'll go with is the Dragon King, uh, who is essentially a humanoid, ancient individual who, as I talked about beforehand, can summon up a gigantic, massive, draconic, Godzilla nuclear-powered living star in the shape of a dragon. Um, it's it's a lot yeah it's it's a big bunch of like um godzilla references and um you know mech stuff it's flesh mechs it's really it's such a fun fight it is the one that feels like you're truly against something titanic as its blows just send your survivors flying everywhere and it stomps around um creating pools of lava and eventually it'll go like meltdown and fire out a huge nuclear blast that um is incredibly damaging but also turns like the lava pools into pillars of iron that you can mine or even make use of as cover it's it's such an iconic model and it is uh currently the largest model 
um, in it's the largest model in the original lot, and it's yeah. a, it's it, a real centerpiece. It feels like a truly titanic showdown, uh, more so than the other god monster that we'll talk in a, in a minute. It's really fun to fight. The gear that it gives is really good. Uh, and on top of all of that, uh, it has probably the best campaign uh, that Kingdom Death uh, offers. It's really thematic. It has a lot of uh, story and it makes survivals be really different from the way that you experience them in the normal Kingdom Death game. Uh, it's It tells a true full story from the start to the end with the, the showdown second the, the tyrant which is its special nemesis that you only fight into the um, uh its own little campaign it's probably the best bang for your buck in terms of uh of campaign uh expansion that you you can buy it's it's really amazing and that's also like a one of kingdom death's strongest uh offers I think. Yeah, I agree. I think it's a great, great campaign. It's my favourite of the three campaigns, thematically and narratively. Um, it is yeah. a, a, the ending. It when it comes to the final fight is a little undertuned, but that's the same with all of them, with the exception of the Gold Smoke Knight, which was done with an understanding of what the players are doing. Um, so the Gold Smoke Knight suggests big and good things for the final Nemesis monsters going ahead and. I I believe that the Dragon King and the Sun uh, are both getting tweaks to make them more challenging at the end of their respective campaigns. Uh, I will note that as much as I love the gear from the Dragon King, um, I think the weapons are a little lacklustre for the power level of the monster. Um, they the, the Scythe is really cool though, it's a, an amazing weapon type. Um, it's just very slot intensive to do cool stuff with it. However, the armor set, the Dragon King armor set, is just superb. It's hard to craft because one of the resources tends to be very difficult to find. It, it often hides. But yeah, it's, it's amazing. And it also has a lot of synergy with the other big box, which is the Sunstalker. And that yeah. is, um, I believe, I'm running from memory here and paraphrasing, but Adam said he went and locked himself off in a room and just worked in isolation on the Sunstalker and this is his brainchild. And for me, um, this is the best quarry monster in the game and probably the best monster in the game. Uh, I love how every single level of this creature that is a basically a living squid shark sun um, is relevant and it has unique gear that you can get from each level. So you're encouraged to fight it all those different levels. And then you like fight it at level one. You're like, wow, this is, you need to be aggressive against this thing. It's quite, it doesn't really tolerate you stalling and it does a lot yeah, of interesting it, stuff. If you go fast, the first level feels um, shockingly easy. And then you have a fight that lasts slightly longer once you experience the level two and you're like, oh, we cannot let this thing pull up. It is, it's going to kill us. It is, it is very fun. It's a fight that really feels like there's a, a just like the, the um, a Slender Man, there's a flow to the fight. There's something that's, that's coming up that you see coming from a, a distance. Uh, well, I think that the campaign from the Dragon uh, King is the best. Uh, I think that the showdown from the, the Sunstalker is the, the, the best showdown in Kingdom Death in general. And that's yeah. why I usually recommend Stunstalker slightly better because you will experience showdowns more than you will experience campaigns. Mm -hmm. uh, and it comes with a campaign that, while not as good as the the Dragon King, it is it is still extremely fun to play. It's also the uh, strongest that survivors ever get. Um, while if you meta play, you can punch God at the end of Kingdom Death Monster. At the end of... Um, uh, ah, what's the name of it? Children of the Sun? No. Um, it's always people. It's people of the sun. People, people of the sun. At the end of people of the sun, uh, even if you don't meet a game, you can punch the sun, the, the a god in the face quite easily. I remember in one campaign of the people of the sun, I uh, had a character just one tapping the phoenix level two, uh, just one hit, and the, the thing was dead. The fight had barely started because survivors get insanely powerful. Yeah, it's it's very fun. It's unique. It puts an interesting spin on things, and there's been a fair bit of promotional gear to add even more to that. So it's clear that Adam still 
uh, has a lot of affection for it and isn't done iterating on it and um, improving it. Uh, a, a it's, very small part of it is also the sky fishing. It's yeah. just fun to do. Yeah, yeah, it's it's fun because yeah, you fight the sun stalkers of quarry and you can make a lure and a harpoon and then suddenly there's this whole extra world of oh my goodness, there's fish above our heads. Um, and there's also other things, really big things up there. And that's a fun little bit of um, just environmental storytelling that doesn't like show you everything. But you're like, oh boy, there's not just that weird sky dream whale up there. There's other things. Ooh. Um, so that, yeah, it's, it's very cool. Um, my biggest thing I like is how much it asks you to make hard choices because... Like, there's a sword in the level three that's really good, but you need a shadow to be able to use it. And you can only get that by getting the lantern from the level one. But there's other things you want to make with the level one, like resources. And then the level two, there's like two different weapons and they're both really fun. But trying to make both of them in the same campaign is it's hard work. It's a lot of effort. So it always feels like something you come back to and do something new with and the armor set itself is as powerful as it is and it is powerful it's also a great tool for making niche and silly weapons viable for a very long time so i love it to pieces because it's it, like it's the glue that lets silly thing things do amazing stuff if you stuck it on a really good weapon it's it's busted but if you use it on something that you love and isn't so great it's a joy it can open so many different builds in the game. It feels like such a rewarding uh, high-level monster to, to chase after, and it never feels like it's too easy for what you what you get out of it. I really like the, the fact that you get those um, uh, sandstones and st sunspot at different levels that, yep. that really unlock those, uh, those things. Yeah, the monster is just really well-crafted. It is. It's uh, a really it, good design. And from the little bit that I've seen of the GC, it seems like Adam learned all the right lessons from the Sunstoker. So I'm very excited about this. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yes, we have um, two smaller ones left. Uh, there's one that I always say to people, uh, if it's it's um, not great value for money um, yeah. at the moment, um, that's the Lonely Tree. But you, you will use it in every single campaign and you will use it as the nightmare tree at times. So actually it is good value for money. Um, but typically I say wait until it's on sale and get it. It's a nemesis monster that kind of isn't really a nemesis. It's more sort of a chance encounter where you either run into it during a hunt or you find it in a showdown. And then afterwards you get access to like this fruit that you can have a survivor eat. Uh, and suffer the consequences but then everyone can go off and hunt the tree and the showdown fight is amazing yeah the like, showdown fight is really fun because it's so different from other it stuff. is it because it's an entirely static enemy and it's using special mechanics to uh neg negate its drawbacks of being static uh by dragging survivors away from it and also creating this like terrifying zone near it that's very dangerous and it has different rewards at depending when you face it um it is a real event it is also like where the, we had the most memorable death in any of the campaigns i played in um which is where literally one survivor like went uh we're losing horribly and we're about to die so um hit hit it really hard <laughs> and hit the locations that allowed you to wound but the retaliations occur and so they just dropped dead right after the attack leaving the tree on like one life or so somebody else could finish <laughs> the whole job it it's it's an epic fight um yeah. my only criticism is it gives you a bone axe um, when you fight it and there's no point ever where you want a bone axe when fighting yeah that's a it's, weird one it's a it's a very weird one it's also a bit weird that the um, fruits that you get as a reward from fighting it are not that good the first one can be really strong the oh. second one is all right and the third one i don't think i've the third one ever found the, really the third good one's technically two and one of them lets you have a savior um yeah and that's actually having a savior in other campaigns especially as the level three one's quite late in the campaign so your savior will go most of the distance to the end of the campaign is very interesting people of the sun with a savior um you know people of the stars with a savior it's yeah. it's pretty cool but definitely I... the the blistering fruit fruit is i think the best yeah 
Um, the 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 Lonely Tree is a really fun showdown. I think that when I when I play the game, it usually shows up uh, two to three times per per campaign, something like that. Yeah. Uh, it's because it's a low chance to encounter, but every every hunt that you you do, you have a chance to get it. So it's it it happens every every now and then. It's just a bit strange that you have those three very specific rewards that you can only experience in certain length in years. So it's it's very. Uh, luck based if you're going to get one or the other and also i don't like a uh, monster that get uh life uh life tokens for their level level three because i think it's quite uh life token cannot get rid of the hl uh mechanic which is so the the ai to the decay game. mechanic where yeah um, when they get wounded their behavior becomes more predictable it, I, I would agree but i'd also just posit that it's nice to have another monster that like like the watcher that you can't mess with its ai so I think yeah uh, yeah if, if it happened a lot i think it would be boring i think I, as a unique thing it's interesting yeah it's just a bit a bit weird, and I would rather have that for like a legendary monster or anything. Sure. But yeah, the, the Lonely sure. Tree is like a fun monster, just definitely not a priority to buy. And the last monster that we'll talk about is also in that vein, uh, the Lion God. Yeah, yeah. So the the Lion God went through a number of iterations, as we know. Um, originally, yeah. it was going to turn up if you hunted too many white lions. Um, it spe- it's got a very significant law. Um, like presence it's really important it's like the king of the previous um civilization or the god was, of the previous yeah. civilization yeah but and we're going to learn more about that when we get the silver city um it just turns out that it's really punishingly hard um which is a fun thing at times but the rewards don't quite make it. So unlike the Dung Beetle Knight, which we'll run at over and over again and be like, hey, maybe he's going to flatten our asses this time, but oh, I'm all for it. Or the it. Sunstalker. Yeah, or the Sunstalker, yeah. The the Lion God just needed... Um, I don't know. I, I honestly feel disappointed that it doesn't have its own crafting location, that it's just a source of iron. That feels like such a letdown, given how iconic um, the uh, Lion God is. But I think based on the artwork we've seen that we are going to probably yeah. get some really cool Lion God based gear. So I me, love the Lion God's I, armor I, that we've seen in the Silver City. I love the I love the Necromancer whole concept of what you get with that. It's very yeah. it's like horrific and also amazing um, and, yeah. and fun. It's it's the it's the monster with the most potential to really grow and given that the back half of it is coming in the future i think we're going to be talking about how amazing the lion god is now that we have the silver city soon i I yeah i do think that i i really hope that adams finished that one soon after cod because it's it's one of the one that i'm i'm expecting the the most of i really like the fight i think that it's really fun especially since it's there's not that many showdowns that are a good um a proof of concept for you high power survivors you can really throw uh the strongest stuff at the at the lion god and it will be it will be interesting to fight but it's super punishing if you do not go there with uh characters that are um busted basically and the, yeah. as you as you mentioned the rewards are not good the necromancer's eye i like a lot i do i like that yeah, but that's only on a on a level one, so it's Yeah, the it's level not... one tends to have the ability to give you the best stuff. And it has the sad. least chance of hitting the one AI card that I think is a design mistake, which is Earthquake. Um yeah. for people who've not encountered Earthquake, it is basically a uh, produces a zone that's an auto kill on any survivor that's in it. Um which would be okay, except there's what happens is it targets your survivor and then you get a flow step. And then it moves towards the survivor. And unless you've perfectly placed it so that it ends with your survivor on a corner of where its base is so it can't actually target you, you're just dead. And I feel like there should have been some opportunity like survivors well, must spend all their survival or die, at least one or die or something. Or just have to move before the flow step or something. Yeah, it, it just needed a little bit of tweaking. Um, it has the rampage yeah. mechanic, which 
uh, is really actually a super fun scary mechanic where if it draws like cards with rampage it'll uh, it's allowed to like draw multiple ai cards at once um, the relentless yeah yeah re- really, yeah relentless really that's, sorry yeah the, the butcher has um uh, its own version where it draws multiple cards a turn but this is way more unpredictable and scales up on a far more fundamental manner i like the way it rips um uh, terrain up and then reveals sinkhole beneath while it hurls the terrain at you that's really fun um and then yeah. you've got that sinkhole that you can go down in and there's a whole load of lore related stuff that I, ties to like the white lions i love the the necropolis and i really wish that it the gear that you'd found in it was less um niche because a lot of the stuff that you can find either e- even on a really lucky roll is extremely uh yeah extremely niche it doesn't feel uh, it doesn't feel any builds uh there's a lot of stuff that just does not feel very useful uh, i've had a hard time finding a good reason to dive into the necropolis more than for the uh, first couple of items yeah it's it's something that i'm sure that the design yeah. team are going to bring together to to a really special exciting thing and it's 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 penciled in to be the final boss of the silver city campaign which is definitely i think it's that's a wonderful place for it to be that's a level four lion god on full tilt sounds like a great way to end a campaign because survivors just dying out of nowhere in the very last fight is i think that's fair game you know yeah that that that's, sounds that yeah. sounds really really fun yeah, i'm excited yeah. for that one there's yeah. one more expansion with massive quotes around that that uh we we need to quickly mention uh you love it i hate it it's i the, uh... love it in concept and i love it because i use it in pieces here and there yeah it's the green knight armor uh it was uh, supposed to be a uh, thing with its own location and like a little bit of lore, a tiny booklet that gives you a very end game rewarding uh, uh, armor to craft from the parts of the different knights. But the way that it ended up being on the table was that it used parts of random monsters to make a really strong armor. And when you buy it, you just get a plastic bag with two miniatures and uh, five cards. And then that's it. That's that's the expansion. I think that it. In just in terms of um, uh, I don't know uh, crafting value, uh, uh, physical value, it's very cheap. It could be a lot better. It could be a lot more. It could feel a lot more premium for something that it's supposed to be an end game goal for a full campaign. Yeah, I mean we. That's the thing. As it stands right now, it's like yeah, sure. It's fair to criticize it um, and. I also think it's a bit unfortunate that it requires spidiculous in amongst its yeah. crafting stuff because it is literally just you just need a innovation from yeah. spidiculous, which is have a, you a, have a you shame. shelled a hundred dollar for spidiculous? Yes or not? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it it that's the one which like for people who bought everything in the full ca- um the full Kickstarter campaign and people who want everything, that's fine. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. But it just it thematically feels odd and it's a bit of a shame. Um, that you don't actually need to ridiculous in the campaign if you own it because the innovation is in your innovation deck as per the normal expansion rules. So yeah exactly uh, yeah yeah it's it's a little bit of a shame uh i do really like how it ties together the gorm for the alchemy and all of the knights together yeah and the, you know and really fleshes out the dung beetle knight's involvement Some, and somehow though it, it is like the the hands of uh one monster to make the the plate the plate instead of the gauntlets like it's there's just little bits that i always found were a little bit strange in the way that they are involved yeah. it's certainly the um the the most loose the... of all of the expansion releases and yeah uh, but we already you have to put a little asterisk next to that and acknowledge that campaigns of death is intending to address this uh and so that's something we yeah. can look forward to and also I... every time i've had green armor in a campaign i've played with other people and i've built the armor set for them so they can play with it. And oh yeah, it's really powerful, fun and it's a really fun set to play for sure. I will. I will also say uh, I am incredibly excited by the bone armor and what it could be because I think that this time Adam will go into a full crafting location, into its own little booklet, into doing something that will feel like a premium end game 
uh, disarmor is 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 uh, meant for killing gut basically. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited for that one. I'm super excited about it because it's an armor set that pr possibly isn't going to be focused around hide. Uh, it would be really <laughs> nice to not always. I I I don't know for sure because I've not seen it, but I I kind of hope the smog singer's set uses more organs than hide. Because it's got a very puffy medieval bard-like look to it. But again, I'm only speculating and some people who are listening might already know the answer to that. So we'll see. Uh, but that's one of the reasons I love the skull helm is it's like, hey, here's a headpiece that just uses bone or a single skull, which is super them thematic. Um, uh, until you start thinking about it and going, so wait a minute, they're putting their head inside a skull. So do do some survivors have really big heads? <laughs> Uh, but it's yeah, it's, it's pretty fun. Um, and that's all of the expansions. Uh, I think it's a good time to call it here. This is way longer than our yeah, normal one. So before sorry, I wrap just... up, do you have any final things you'd like to say here? I know, in fact, you know what? I'm not going to let you say any final things here because we're going to be talking with Audrey. We can do that on Friday, yeah. yeah. there's more stuff we're going to be talking about. We'll probably have a different focus because we're going to let Audrey lead the conversation with as much as they want to talk about. So anyway, for now, this is the end of our first part of talking about Kingdom Death and why it's so important and why it's so engaging and enjoyable and why it's a lifestyle game and why it is much cheaper than playing Magic the Gathering. <laughs> um so you know there's that uh and um well all i gonna say is that's all we have time for right now so uh, this we've been the last standee and my name is fen and i'm saying goodbye and alexis uh goodbye and thank you for listening yep thank you very much for listening and we'll catch you soon with part two